What is up, my dogs? It's your boy, Mike Mason, coming at you in hypersaturation vision. I don't know, guys. <laughs> my webcam has been giving us so much trouble, so I'm on my uh, backup, as it were. But, uh, guys, we have an incredible show on deck tonight. Uh, I'm thrilled to have special guests with us to help us narrate this thing. Uh, we're taking it back to Las Vegas, uh, 2022. So just about a year ago, and uh, Taffy the Gray took the stage and demonstrated an incredibly unique and well thought out method of working that I am just thrilled to share. Uh, let me take a moment and introduce my uh, awesome panel we have tonight. I'm so stoked. Uh, we'll just do it from the top down. You guys know him from your toolbox. Scott Griffin is with us. Griffin Glass <laughs> Tools, man. It's so great to have you, dude. You're just like a friend of me, but everybody else, you're just like the mysterious tool maker. It's a pleasure <laughs> to be here, for sure. <laughs> yeah, man. It's great to have you with us, brother. Uh, and my lovely co-host is, is down there on the left, Carrie Strope. How's everyone doing? Good to yeah. see you. Glad we have some special guests for you tonight. We always have a good time, but it's always so much more fun when the artists can join us or other folks that you know, have some skin in the game here at, uh, in the glass industry. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, you know, speaking of the man of the hour, uh, Taffy, the gray is with us, man. Thank you so much for joining us. How are you doing? Well, thank you. Thanks for having me. I appreciate yeah, it, Mike. Of, of course, man. Of course. It's always awesome to cross paths with you and you're always up to something really interesting. Um, yeah, and this method of working, uh, can you talk to us a little bit about how it came about? Yeah, um, well, I mean, I started off in the hot shop back in 2005 and did about 10 years in the hot shop before I switched to Boro. Uh, and I tried to go full in, you know, Italian flame working style and, you know, do the blow and push thing. And it really struggled. I really struggled to shape that way. Uh, I was pulling tubing back happy tubes early days and my shoulders are going out from breaking up 38 by four tubes by the case every day I'd be breaking up these cases and I had a buddy of mine make me a roller um, and what I wanted was one that had a trough in the middle which there just wasn't anything on the market at the time uh, that did that um, so that I could turn more like I was at a bench in the hot shop and it was just more comfortable for me so I started doing that I started um just breaking down that tubing and rounding off the end uh, and prepping out this stuff. And then I was just doing that one time and I was like, man, I wonder if I can shape like this. And then it just sort of, you know, blossomed into how can I inter integrate the stuff that I had learned in the hot shop and, and sort of, you know, push that limit of, it's kind of cool. It's like, it's like uh, reducing the variables and instead of trying to like, you know, turn something and paddle something and keep a straight edge wall I can do it just like I would with jacks on at a bench and it just felt more natural for me. So okay. sorry, a long winded story, but that's pretty much how I got to be making those rollers. No, no, no. That was all the detail I wanted and more. Hell yeah. Um, and then I wanted to also ask about uh, the stand that you have with the hand torch and everything. At what point did you mm -hmm. add that to it? I think with the articulating mount. Um, yeah, I mean, I, most people use rollers just to center their bubble, which is, really important step but um figuring out how to heat and and leave the piece on the roller and move the flame away um i started off with just you know a single hole in my gtt front torch so i could twist it you know okay. and, and point the flame at the piece and point the flame away or tilt it underneath the piece or tilt it above um and i realized that if i had more articulation i wouldn't have to move the roller so much i, I found myself trying to get further out in the flame for certain heats and up close if I'm tearing open a hole. Um, so it just kind of hit me. I should be able to move this torch around more than I am. Um, so yeah, it was just, it was just a, how can I, how can I do that with a GTT uh, Delta Elite that, or sorry, Delta Mag that's just massive and, you know, there isn't much on the market that will sustain this kind of weight in the way that I want to be able to move it around. Right, right, for sure. Excellent. <clears throat> All right, man. Well, uh, I, we, we'll have a, we'll have like plenty of time to talk about some of these, uh, details, uh, as we get into the demonstrations. So yeah, if you guys are ready, I'd like to pop that off. Yeah. I wanted to share one thing with the homies. I posted a reel the other day. I was kind of teasing, uh, the, that dragon tears, uh, dragon eye. And, and I wanted to show you guys that before we pop this off, man. I was 
pretty stoked on how this turned out. So, um, yeah. And guys, I'll be, I'll be, I'm in the middle of like stocking this and another iCane, uh, into the store. So like tomorrow morning, I'll do a proper announcement or whatever, but you know, maybe if you check the shop later tonight or early, you might just find something there for you anyways. All right, let's pop this bad boy off. And homies, we just take one minute here at the beginning uh, to shout out these companies and events that all kind of uh, pitch in or help with my arrangements or whatever it'll be to kind of help keep this party going. Um, I frankly, I spend you know I, a lot of my own money to to really be able to walk through all the doors that are open. But the reality is that these cats pitch in a significant amount and make it possible for me to provide our industry with, you know, high quality coverage and take the time to really edit it properly and put together, you know, hopefully really amazing shows for you guys that, you know, honor these events and these artists and, you know, give you guys, you know, a little something new to put into to your uh, mental toolbox or whatever. It's uh, my mission from Glass God or whatever. And then these guys are the ones putting into the collection plate or whatever. So, I really do appreciate it, uh, and you know this is kind of a family thing. I know all these people; they're all awesome. Cody with Fresh uh, Glass Company, man, sponsoring everything. All of these are awesome people, and they help make a lot of things possible. And some of you guys pitching in at TorchPass.org, y'all rock. Uh, but the man of the hour, Taffy, here again, in stunning 2K. <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's the best i can do uh with these live streams but anyways uh here we are we're at glass vegas 2022 an amazing trade show that is you know pretty much entirely focused on like domestic made you know artistry um and here is the taffy uh turner I've been calling it the taffy roller a lot lately. Sorry about that. Yeah, but <laughs> it's interchangeable. I feel like it is, yeah. But then I looked it up on the store and I was like, oh, snap. I've been uh, out here. Even, <laughs> I've been uh, dead naming my man or whatever. And uh, all right. But here we, you're doing a seal here, something really basic. But, uh, you know, it's like it's awesome to start with the basics on something like this. And what this is just a straight seal or whatever. Yeah, yeah. It's just, you know, it's always tricky doing that seal with that much glass freehand. So this is an ideal trying to get this this uh, seal done on the roller, but there's really no ideal way to do it other than a lathe. Gotcha. Um, yeah, so this is just getting it set up. I'm not trying to get it strong or perfect. I, I generally get it on the stick and then heat up the rest of the glass and then switch it around and, and get after it once I can really center it better on the other side. Okay, all right. And can you talk to us about the stand that it's on? It looks like you can slide the entire roller back and forth and adjust the height on it. Yeah, we, we call that the riser plate. It's um, it, it's uh, you know, a piece of aluminum, and there's these little brass uh, thrust bushings that sit underneath it. It rides on, so it's kind of some smooth action. It just it allows you to elevate it up above your flame, which I really um, suggest you do for a roller. So you can you can basically shoot up at the piece and then point down and go underneath it and then you can see the silhouette of the piece with the flame underneath it much easier um so yeah getting it up above you can also slide it back and forth so sometimes i'm working on a can that's got a huge blow pipe and it's really long and then i'll go and grab a, a mouthpiece and it's really short and i can just slide the roll over, roller over on the riser and be in the right part of the flame and it's not as you know i don't i don't have to worry about it it floats above all the tools just, okay. uh, and you ooh, know taking it up a notch <clears throat> i really i always uh, in a lot of these shots i try to keep your hand in the frame because it it just it's very informative uh did somebody teach you these methods based on like traditional scientific tooling or did you kind of come up with these movements on your own and especially like the hand crawl that you do to keep it continuously rotating like how did all those come about um, that, that stuff I figured picked up back in the hot shop days. I think I was blowing glass for maybe six or seven years before I saw somebody do the crawl. Uh, it was Joe Cariotti out in California. Um, and I was like, wow, that's kind of neat. And I asked him what was important about that and why, you know, why go through the effort of doing it that way? And he said the, you know, 
the centrifugal snap that you create when you go heel to toe um, on your palms to the tip of your fingers, every time you change directions, you're snapping that glass into an oval and you're thickening it up in two points and you're leaving it with a memory that's hard to get rid of. So if you can slow it down and stay one direction, you can get a lot hotter and condense that glass and just let it cool down, pull the flame away and then shape and blow from there. Um, so yeah, just trying to trying to minimize those variables and not have that centrifugal snap go. Um, but it took me years to really get that crawl down and I was doing it, you know, with a half inch blow pipe in the hot shop. And once I figured out I could do it in Boro, it took a long time to figure out how to just, how to get the right rotation and, and, and be able to power through it. It's, uh, it's definitely a very deceptively tricky technique, but it really rewarding and really fun way to work. And you know, Nico, I can really tell that the the hand motion that you have when you're when you're doing the crawl is identical to what you see in the hot shop when someone has really captured this motion as well mm -hmm. nice. so yeah it's it's interchangeable i think and you, you've you know. worked pretty in the hot shop a lot of your work was pretty large right yeah yeah i did a lot of large work i did a lot of production stuff but i was in school most of the time i was in hot shop <laughs> And I did, you know, a lot of big sculptural stuff. So um, trying to figure out how to work without destroying my hands and my body was uh, necessary working, working, you know, two production jobs and going to grad school. Do you think that the, as, um, I guess maybe it's somewhat obvious, but in the hot shop, the larger you work, the more even the, uh, the bench rotation is in a sense. I know it's wear and tear on your body as well. Yeah, yeah, it's, I mean, trying to figure out how to use a fulcrum and, and work in ways where you're not really lifting, you're just kind of tilting and letting the mass kind of do its thing. Um, and then turning the more mass, the, the sort of slower you have to go, the momentum's crazy. So changing directions is really tricky. Yeah, it's, it was, um, it's been really interesting sort of spending so many years in the hot shop and then doing Boro and feeling like I had no idea what I was doing. Like I had to relearn everything. But once I got the hang of it, I started seeing sort of, I don't know, things in between the two realms of approach um, that I think could be integrated. And that's, it's just been the, the past five years for me has been how, how much can I integrate these two practices and sort of, uh, uh, bring all the stuff that I had learned and, and worked on previously uh, and keep us utilizing it. Um, so it's been really fun sort of exploring the gap. Nice. Um, <clears throat> we had a question in the chat. Uh, homie was asking, uh, are these the evil vegetable patch asks? <laughs> Let me get their name right. <laughs> dun, dun, dun. <laughs> right, yeah. Uh, are these the latest version of the rollers? Uh, yeah, I believe so. I think this is the version three roller that we're looking at here. Okay, and what are the changes that have been made to the roller throughout the throughout its like product history or whatever? Well, we started off with a solid welded aluminum roller, um, and I tried to do it in such a way where you could pass a pipe through these this tube basically that was welded to each end plate. Um, and then string two rollers in one and have sort of, you know, a roller on each side. But it really ended up not working very well. Um, so version two was um, the one with the taffy logo cut through it. It was, you know, a really fun way to show off the water jet process. Um, it was five eighths plates on either side and the, the center bar was a little thicker. And there were these uh, end caps that held the, the plates onto the center bar. Um, and the the hardware stuck out so the version three um we we switched it to half inch plate we thinned it out which is plenty strong um and made the center bar a little bit smaller and we uh, recessed all the hardware and countersunk everything so it's just a little more sleek uh we did away with the logo cut through because it was just a very expensive uh pretty <laughs> addition <laughs> wasn't okay. really functional I and switch you. to a, la a laser engraved logo um, instead. So not a not a whole lot of functional changes other than the new hole for the uh, the shepherd's hook. Yeah, can um, you tell us a bit about that? What is uh, what are the accessories for this? Like I, we talked about the riser plate, but what are the other things you can add to this? 
Um, so the the shepherd's hook is the newest thing we've done, and it's um, it's this little. It's basically replacing the D ring that was on the version two. And the D ring, I just one day realized if I had this sort of thing that could flip up and I could stick my tube in it and leave it over a Bunsen burner, it would probably be you know advantageous. Um, and for years, I was really angry that I couldn't use my blow hose easily. I had to take the blow hose boot off and stick it through the D ring and then stick the blow hose you know, back on. And there are times when you're heating and shaping where you want to rip it off the rollers and do something by hand. Um, so after thinking about it for a while, we came up with this hook system uh, and it's basically a little chuck and chucks on down, has these bearings and you can, you can chuck down onto uh, between nine mil and I think, um, I think it's like 26 mil. Uh, and, and then you can get in and out of it, just tilting at an angle and you can get in and out of the roller and leave that hook engaged. Um, so that's one thing. And it, it, it does make things easier. I think people who are doing like, you know, vac stacks by hand, uh, would really benefit from having that kind of hook. Cause you can, you can really just sort of let go and, and just barely coast, you know, with, a, with minimal effort. Um, it also, when learning the crawl, the hardest part is keeping downward pressure the whole time. That's like rule number one. And it just feels really awkward for a long time. So putting that hook on there, it's kind of like, um, you know, the rubber bands on the ends of chopsticks to learn okay. the crawl. It's, it's like an easy way to, to practice getting that momentum and keeping an even turn and everything. And then as you get better at putting pressure downward, you can do it without the hook. Um, yeah. So that's one, yeah. that's, that's the hook. And then the other thing we do is the, the heat shields, uh, which not a lot of people use. Um, I don't think a lot of people do heat build up heat on the roller like I do. I'll tend to build up heat on the roller and then lift it up by hand to get my final heat where I'm really soaking it in and then set it back down on the roller and move my flame away. But a lot of that time, especially when I'm working large, I'm just roasting my hands. And I, I hate doing the, you know, the aluminum foil and paper plate thing. Um, so, so this heat shield is this thing that snaps down on around your blowpipe. Uh, you can get in and out and it's, it's, uh, it's a little more convenient way to protect your hand. So I'm, I'm really pleased with that accessory in particular, but it's, it's not something I think a lot of people need. Okay. <clears throat> and talk us through what's happening here. You're, you're shaping out the, that angle for the base right now. Is that right? Yep. Yeah, that's right. I'm getting ready to do the foot. So I'm kind of chasing out that angle. Um, I tend to work from the tip inward, which is opposite from the hot shop. Where I'll, I'll spend a lot of time evening out the material that I'm tearing away uh, and rounding that tip so that there's no weird optic nipple, you know, moving around. And that takes sometimes several heats and, and soaking it in. And then once that's there, I'll work my way back in towards the center of the piece. Um, so right here, I'm getting ready to do the foot. But in general, if I was to make this into a, just a plain cylinder, I would work my way to about halfway back or just past that and try really hard to keep it in line. And then I'd pop a hole in the end and I'd flip it around and I would do the same thing to the opposite side, working the tip, going back towards the middle. Uh, and it's just, it, it's for me, it's a more controlled way to, to, you know, change the volume, but keep really clean optics. I'm kind of letting it get cold and blowing when it's really cold and trying to freeze with the paddle and tell the glass where to be. And this is very similar to how you'd work in the hot shop with jacks. Where you set the jacks on the side and blow out to the jacks and then freeze it, freeze those high points that are coming in contact with the metal. Word. That's just what I would have said. No, I'm just playing. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just messing around. <laughs> it's very accurate. And, and you're right that you truly don't want to get too far past the middle point of, of the piece uh, with, with a great amount of heat anyway. Yeah, with all that weight flipping around down there. Um, if I do, sometimes... I'll work my way back through and I'll blow out just a little section at a time, inch by inch. And once I have it kind of close to what I want, I get the whole thing raging hot and usually pick it up by hand, hold it down, hold it up, try to build up that heat really well and then set it down and then blow it all out at once to my paddle to get one final, you know, this is the plane that I want it. And it, it that kind of helps give the optics that little extra shine. <clears throat> and this this is so that you don't have to work against the weight of the rest of the piece. That's why you work into the middle and then switch to the other side. Well, that that and I'm not very good at turning two hands at once. <laughs> um, okay, gotcha. So I like I, I prefer you know I'm used to working one side 
with an attachment to a blowpipe um, in the hot shop and eating that, you know, working one side, flipping it around on a punty. Um, so this is just what I'm more comfortable with. But I do think it's a fun way to work. Um, also, when I'm doing this kind of heat in the tip here, you, you have all this like extra weight flopping around. So the further you get back towards your hands, towards the blowpipe, the more weight is, is messing with you on the tip here. Yeah. Um, and if you mm -hmm. have, if you, if that's moving with you, then it's not, it's not like a lead weight that's just yanking around. It kind of flows and, and, you know, it's just more easy to, to dance with when the whole thing is kind of hot. Okay. Um, another thing that I'm doing here when I'm stretching out a piece, um, typically I get this heat. Well, this is this is actually the heat at what I was talking about, where I heat the whole thing all at the once that I had previously blown out and then do all, you know, get that final sort of straight wall before I flip it around. But if I was to try to um, make this into a cylinder, I would be heating that whole mass I just heated and then I'd heat closer towards the tip because there's less weight pulling on that. So I would kind of put a, a gradient of heat through that that um, cylinder with more heat being on the tip where the less weight is affecting it. And it would pull into a cylinder um, instead of like a, you know, a snake belly or a sort of heavy, I don't know. It's a, uh, I, I also, you know, tend to go until I'm happy with it. So this, this obviously I wasn't happy with the first round of heat. I'm going to do it again. And I think now, now I'll start switching towards the bottom. Okay. Um, and if anybody... yeah, and sometimes, <clears throat> oh, sorry, go ahead, man. Sometimes if I'm a little crooked here in the middle, like I messed up when I, when I blew this out and it's just, it's not gonna, I wouldn't want to push the bottom cause it's too off center. I'll flip it around sometimes twice just to recenter it. I'll sometimes while I have it, you know, two handed, I'll straighten out that center and get it more aligned get it right and then go back to doing the bottom. But I try to set it up so I'm not like, you know, I don't have like a, a limp tire or something. I'm, it's the straighter you are, the more fun it is to work. Right, for sure. Yeah, it's significantly less fun once you're fighting against that sort of jam. Um, I was just gonna say if anybody is tuning in cause you just got the notification, you didn't see the thumbnail, uh, Taffy is making a double walled vacuum cylinder. So it's almost like one tumbler inside of another tumbler. Wait till y'all see at the end what was done with that. I uh, included that Instagram video at the very end. Oh, cool. Yeah. Uh, I don't even want to spoil it if nobody knows. Don't, don't go looking it up. <laughs> no, I'm just playing. But it's I'm telling you, it's probably the coolest piece of drinkware on the planet. Like, I'm not even playing around. Like if you show me a cooler one after y'all see this thing and I would be surprised. All right. And so this is the, this is like the sparkly color that went on the inside. Did you, what color was that? That's some libdenum sulfide, uh, Molly sparkle from, um, greasy glass. And what is it called? Uh, it's, I think it's, it's Molly sparkle. Okay. Um, I'm not sure what they call this. They, they've made several iterations of it. I know it's, um, you know, molybdenum sulfide color, uh, which okay. means it's not, there's no chromium in the sparkle. So it's not going to mess with you if you heat it up for too long. Oh, interesting. Um, it yeah. it does kind of outgas, it does kind of weird things, but it's not, it, it's not dangerous. It's just, it's uh, it'll turn sort of brown from the sulfur. I think if you work it for a while, like but I really like, I enjoy working this, these colors a lot. Um, these these molybdenum based colors they uh they're say, funny mike, they go ahead oh i was gonna say mike was getting all ecstatic about the name <laughs> the, they, i was just it, tripping on that chemical color the name he was yeah. mentioning and i was like whoa 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 i didn't know we were breaking bad over here <laughs> well it's cool the stuff that has this really high you know metallic content is it the heat seems to move through it like it would metal like it's more I don't know, mm. conductive than, right. than the glass that have other colors. So, which is kind of good and kind of bad, depending on what you're doing with it. <laughs> hmm. But this is encased in clear, um, which I prefer. I like working tubing. Um, I mean, I had a lot of tubing around when I started working. I, I started pulling tubing before I really got on the torch. And I had all this like very secondary grade tubing that I was like, okay, what, how do you use this and what constitutes good tubing? And now, um, I, because of that 
I, I really enjoy working with tubing that's already prepped out. It's already got a clear coat on it. You know, I want the whole point of tubing is to save you time. I don't want to spend the time to prep out a bubble if I can just go right to shaping. Right. And speaking of, uh, tell us about this paddle. Um, this is a paddle I've been working on. Um, I have a few iterations of it. Uh, I call it the multi paddle and it's, it's, you know, basically like a French curve on a stick just going to say uh, with that with a few yeah a few other little it, it's it's sort of a, an amalgamation of a paddle that I got back in the day I think from Bison Tools that I use all the time and I love shaping with and um I couldn't find anywhere a replacement um so I sort of made a bigger version and then I put this curve in there and it allows it's sort of instead of taking three heats to to where that I where I'm heating right now to straighten that out and then go back down to the butt and and re-round that off with this paddle i can do you know i can chill everything at once and control all the surfaces as they blow out so even if it has a weird memory in this color i can kind of tell it where to be much easier than i could if i just had a flat plane to interact with the glass hmm. some question in chat about the stiffness of this glass versus uh like disco or steel wool um, it's similar. It's, it's pretty stiff. It's not quite as stiff as steel wool. Uh, and it's, you know, especially encased in clear, it's, it's a lot more buttery to work. It's weird because it takes, it's like stiff until it moves and then it stays moving quite a while with this clear layer on it. Um, and I'm, I'm really taking my time here. I'm, I think at home with my own torch, I kind of go as fast as I can, but you know, in a demo, I'm trying to sort of make sure I don't mess up and get too thin. That's um, that's one thing that working one-sided is not very good at dealing with thin glass. I, I try to work pretty thick. Okay. <clears throat> kind of need some structure to support it as you're working or? Yeah, and the way I look at it, it's like the bigger the collar is um, of the mass that I'm trying to heat, the more control I have. So if I'm trying to blow some big big bubble with this tiny little collar and shoulder, it's going to give me trouble. So I'll, I'll kind of work through a whole tube and get it like, you know, two and a half inches, two inches uh, in diameter. Um, so that way, when I go back and heat it, I, I have a lot more control of, of how it's going to gather and, and um, what I can do with it. Um, man likes it thick yeah so i'm i'm really taking my time but this um yeah so i chase my way back down to the center here oh it looks like i'm gonna do one more heat <laughs> back up there <laughs> getting dangerous <laughs> yeah it is it's kind of like do i want to deal with this on the other side you know or um, yeah yeah south yeah. of the equator or whatever here right Sometimes I'll do this where I'll heat it up and then I'll support with the paddle towards there I am. Yeah. Supporting the tip and I'm letting the glass fall onto center. So I'll kind of, you know, swivel, you know, on the high side and let that mass fall into center and then try to freeze it as I blow it out. Now, little soft, soft glass tricks to center. A lot of times when we do a transfer to a punty, um, the, the punty is hotter than the piece in that one moment. So the assistant will take a flash on the piece that, that just broke off the blowpipe. And when they bring it back, we have a chance to grab it with preheated tweezers uh, and find that high side and let it fall back onto center. And, you know, from goblets to giant sculptures, generally there's this one moment you get to do that. Um, okay. And that's what I was trying to do there by supporting the tip. Gotcha. So basically, folks, you really need to go learn in a hot shop if you want to work on just playing. <laughs> <laughs> Those spend five years punty. in a hot shop, and and this is a bit of a slower way to work. I think. I mean, I know people who work two-handed that can smoke me when it comes to making something this this scale, even. Um, but uh, it's just a very controlled way to work, uh, and it's much easier on my body. I feel like I can do this, you know, longer in the day than I could if I was trying to freehand everything. Okay. And hopefully long into my lifetime, you know. Yeah, for sure. And do you also have a lathe or? 
I don't, not in my studio, unfortunately. Um, okay. It would be nice to have, and I, I hope to get one soon. But um, the the other thing is traveling. I want to be able to work when I travel. And in my experience, lathes are like when you figure out how to work on the one that you work on, you know, when you go on to another one, it's this whole, you know, it's like driving somebody else's car. It's just different. it's a little bit awkward. It's, it's like yeah. you said, it's, it's like running someone else's car. OK. Yeah. All right. So this, you know, I can throw my roller in my bag and take it to Las Vegas and do this demo. I don't need a lathe to do it. So right. I try yeah. not to be, you know, it's funny. People say, oh, you're using a roller, you're cheating. And then, oh, you're using a lathe, you're cheating. I don't think any of that has any uh, reason to be in the conversation. It's, it's how can you do this to the best of your ability without hurting yourself? Right. Tools are there to make possible. the job easier. Yeah. Yeah, that's funny. I think it was Micah Evans maybe was talking about when they went over to China and met these lamp workers over there that would just do everything with machines, you know? I forget mm -hmm. the word he used. He was like, when when they came to learn that they do everything by hand, they were like, oh, that's like artificial glass blowing or something like that. Like they didn't, like they were the opposite. Like they didn't think that yeah. blow, doing, it, doing it without the machines was the real thing or whatever. It was really interesting. <laughs> So when I'm when I'm working on a double walled cup, this is the inner wall. Um, I'm I want to have as little you know gap between the two without making it impossible to do that seal uh, as I can. So I'm um, I I take it especially slow when I'm blowing out this inner wall and trying to keep everything nice and tight. Um, and the Sliding the two inside of each other. It took me a while to figure out a way to do this without a lathe. Um, I, I started using a 16 mil handle on the outer wall, um, outer cup, and then using a 12 millimeter handle on the inner cup. And I make basically a, a I, ra I round off the end of the 12 mil so that it's a solid connection. And I pop a little hole so I have air pressure in that small, um, that, that 12 mil. And I make sure it's longer than the 16 mil so that when I slide this inner cup into the outer cup and the 12 mil inside of the 16 mil, it supports it so it's not wiggling around. It's tight enough and it sticks out the 12 mil just long enough so that I can tape the two together and then put a blow hose boot over everything and still have air pressure. And that way the two cups don't slide, you know, in and out when I'm trying to do that seal. They stay exactly where I tape them. That's good. Um, That's smart. Um, and that allows me to get that seal. Yeah. Kiva Ford taught me a, a similar trick that scientific glass workers use. And in order to not have to make it longer and do all that taping and stuff, they actually mm -hmm. fold little strips of paper and put it into the, the blow tube. So when it slides mm -hmm. in, like any length will just hold pretty tight. And then you can do the seals that you have to do or whatever. But yeah, there, there's an alternate uh, way to go about that. With that type of seal move or whatever. They love, yeah, yeah, they're plenty of ways. They love yeah. cardboard in the uh, in the scientific <laughs> world. I hear it all the time. And yeah, they do. <laughs> in Teflon tape. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's pretty funny. Yeah. And then don't ever read like an old scientific textbook, man, because they use asbestos for everything. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. Yeah, I, I didn't really know uh, or have a lot of access to scientific glass uh, over my career. And I've had some chances to learn it. This summer I spent up at um, Boston Distillery Shop, which was a really uh, interesting sort of survey into scientific processes. I learned yeah. a lot about, yeah, who, you know, what's actually happening on a scientific <laughs> right. level. Right. Speaking of, <laughs> I think that that's who you're talking to. He's going to pop into frame here any minute. But, yeah, the home oh, cool. the Boston Distillery thing, man. Yeah. Uh, Jacob, yeah. right? Um, Jared. Jared, I'm sorry, my bad, my bad. Sorry, Jared. We love you. You're the best. <laughs> he really is, though, you guys. If you don't follow the Boston Distillery uh, thing on Instagram, man, absolutely incredible. He's always posting super informative stuff. And uh, yeah, it's a yeah, good man. resource. Yeah, yeah, super cool cat to chat to if you ever get a minute as well. Yeah. Yeah. He's um he's a knowledgeable dude. I'm excited to have him on here. Yeah, he makes an appearance at some point. Cool. 
Oh yeah, on the video, I see what you're saying. I thought yeah, you were yeah, actually yeah, coming yeah. on a live chat for a second. <laughs> no, no, man. I if I you, you know, story time. Yeah. <laughs> When I was at Jared's the first time I went up to to visit him and and see the shop and hang out up there, or maybe it was the second time, he had a, a ASGS meeting and we're all hanging out, um, blowing glass afterwards. And Vila G was there. Vela Vela G was there, and he uh, he he did a little demo cup, and I was working next to him, and I had my gloves sitting on the table, and he breaks off one of the cups and sets it on my glove to cool, and it just <laughs> starts smoking, and the whole shop smells like Kevlar burning. So I took a marker, a Sharpie, and I wrote Villa G was here on my glove. That's what I was just showing off into the yeah, frame. Yeah. I like so don't, don't leave your gloves around Vela if he's doing demos. Yeah, <laughs> keep your gloves away from that guy. Yeah. Uh, no, right, I love so Chris. You're... I'm just giving a hard time. Yeah. So here you're setting up for the handle switch or whatever to, to blow out the other side or whatever? Yep. Yep, and I'm... You know, when I'm working in Hot Shop and using jacks, typically you take the tips of the jacks and you ride on the cold, round shoulder and blow out the hot glass to the jacks. And you kind of, you know, you're riding that cold glass and forcing the angle that you want uh, and blowing out to it. So that's essentially what I did with the paddle. I'm riding the tip of the paddle on the cold glass and blowing out that angle uh, and trying to set it up so that the rest of the cup will follow that line and make that pint glass shape. Yeah. Now, one thing I've I've not noticed you use at all is like calipers. Like how are, how are you sizing this uh, as you go to ensure that the, the diameters are tight and all that is is this just a uh, you know, I should be using calipers when doing this and sometimes I do if I'm trying to especially if I'm trying to recreate the same piece over again. But in, in general, it's like a muscle memory thing. If I'm making two cups, I'll know one's bigger than the other and that's why i go real slow on the first one i'll go out a little bit and then i'll test fit it and if there's more room i'll go out a little bit more um so yeah i just i just kind of uh shoot for <laughs> shoot for the right sizes okay. sometimes i get lucky <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> it's like calipers are for pussies mike <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's it's more like you know you make so many cups it's it's uh it just i don't know it's a feel thing it's like okay i think that's close and then i check and i'm like okay i'm wrong you know yeah so you've had i should be it, it would definitely t it would definitely save me time if i just made you know used calipers and made sure i was doing it right the whole way okay <laughs> use calipers everybody don't don't do what i do <laughs> <laughs> Don't use you calipers, said, have unprotected sex. Oh, Lord. You said this was um, not your torch. Well, I'm assuming this is not your torch that you're using here. Um, this, this is a, a new a new travel torch that I got um, for stuff like this. Uh, it's really hard to travel with my Delta mag, mag yeah. and giant um, mount. So um, I got one of these nifty hand torches, and Boston Steeler makes these little clips and and... Um, he basically made a mini version of my mount that I designed so that um, I could take it on the road, something a little more portable. Okay. Um, and this works really well, except I'm, I really do a lot of two handed stuff where I need a foot pedal and I, you know, I can't work without my roller and it's really hard to work without my grip and pedal. Um, so I'm not stoked on this tool. I think if I ever get a lathe, I would use that torch for a lathe but if anyone wants to buy that hand torch let me know <laughs> i want to get i want to get one of those new those new uh, lever action dudes i feel like that would be a little more um conducive to my style yeah. triple of nice plugs there all in one you know so. <laughs> <laughs> ah, that was good branding right there <laughs> um <laughs> I, I, it did work pretty well. I, at some point, I had to have Jared come over there and, and turn the torch, you know, the stages on and off for me. Um, yeah, it's just it's awkward having it down there. But it's so nice when you're doing something big and, you know, I got to unclip it from the table there and, and, you know, hold something up and blast the torch up at it. Um, it's a really convenient uh, thing to have a Delta lead on a stick. Yeah. <laughs> on a stick, that look, that on a stick. Ideal. 
Now, some of that too cracked off, but it didn't matter. You you still have enough, I take it? Yeah, yeah. I, I made this whole thing bigger than it needed to be. Okay. Um, yeah, I think I started with this material thinking I was going to tear some away, and then I just was like, oh, well, I'll just use it all. I don't want to waste it. Sure. Um, so same process. I, I take my time to even out that tip and try to get rid of that memory and that, that weird optic nipple. It's especially pronounced in metallic colors for some reason. You know, it does those hmm. those sort of chatoyancy waves or whatever that goes on. Okay. So trying to get that trying to get the the wall weight to be even is challenging with colors like this. All right. And is that like a little magnetic mount for a Bunsen on that stand as well? Yep. Cool. Yeah, I don't think those are in production, but they're nifty, and they might be someday. I don't know. Right. That's a yeah. question for Jared. Right. Maybe if you ask I, really nicely. Yeah, I tried to get the other style I I made into production, and it, it just never never took off. <laughs> All right. Yeah. What's up with that? There's stat? a lot of challenges. <laughs> <laughs> There's yes. a lot of challenges to doing this stuff. Yeah. For producing tools. I, I don't I don't envy you, Scott, and I appreciate all the help you've given me. <laughs> there are challenges with it, that's true. Yeah. Yeah. And they're cha they're changing all the time. You know, the the part of me changing the design to v ver version three was I just couldn't afford to do it because of the rising cost of metal. Huh. Um it, you know, I, it, I go ahead. You really kind of nailed it. I mean the the world of industry and industry resources um it's some one one of the greatest things is the material flow that we went through over the last two and three years um and, and just in general it's a it's a strange animal to to know how to navigate yeah yeah it's it's a bit of a nightmare really um and with all the policy changes and a bunch of companies moved their production back to the U.S. Uh, you know, during the Trump administration, and it, it basically all these giant companies were coming into the shops that that we were working with and saying, "Oh, you know, here's this eighty thousand dollar government job, you know, that's way more important than glass tools and rollers." Um, you know, so there's, there's a certain amount of that too, dealing with production, and uh, it's huh. uh, it's 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 a very competitive. <laughs> market out there thought we were making america great again people whatever <laughs> <laughs> all right here's another a big a pretty big move there yeah yeah so I, I got to this point a lot faster because the other side was already blown out i had that collar so i kind of chased it from the tip back to that middle point and then got the whole thing hot and blew it all out and i'm trying to just you know get rid of the saddles get rid of the high points um sometimes i'll hang it down and stretch out those points sometimes i'll i'll stick it up to another blowpipe and pull it out you know two-handed um so especially if i'm going to push maria's obviously i'm i'm going to put another blowpipe on there and do that but uh so would you say since the since the diameter is already established on your handle side um bringing it, it gives support to the tubing that you just blew out yeah, it's just a lot easier to get to meet as well, right? Right, and instead of taking like three heats to do something, I can do it a lot faster because I have that big wide support collar. Um, yeah, and it's it's just easier to control. Also, a lot of these, you know, like Salt says, you got to wake up the tubing. So whenever I start working, even if a, a tube looks like a first and it looks like it's super clean and even walled, it generally has some kind of weird memory. And when I chase through it, I'm kind of waking up the tubing, trying to, you know, homogenize any bubble lines into spheres, little spheres, so they're not optically annoying. And um, and just, just sort of evening out the wall weight. So I do everything kind of cold, where I, I get it just hot enough, let it cool down, blow it out, do that, you know. If the glass is thinner, it cools down faster. And, and sort of try to get it even more even before I start shaping it. It's definitely one of the annoying sides of working tubing and why a lot of people want to do blowouts instead. And I get it. Yeah. But if you do, if you do take the time to work through it and kind of even it out before you start shaping it, it's, it's just a lot more fun. 
And are you condensing it all at all when you do that to even it out, or are you just going through and puffing it out to a diameter? I, I, yeah, I generally condense it a little bit and then blow it back out and condense okay. it a little bit. And you know, especially if it's really off and I'm trying to even it out. Um, yeah, and um, I think I think I'm actually flipping it around here to blow it out more. I'm, I can't remember the order of operations here. That may have happened. Yeah, I don't know. It's been a while. I edited the, I did this a, a little while ago, and it just took a minute to get everybody here together at the right time. And mm -hmm. yeah, I'm so glad you guys could join us. This has already been spectacular. You've added so so much to this demo, uh, Taffy. Thank you again. Oh, man, for yeah, being my, here. my pleasure. My pleasure. Um, what I'm doing there with my hand, uh, you know that trying to block out my vision from the rest of the piece and just I generally pick a point that I'm going to center the rest of the piece from so in that case I'm probably looking up by the shoulder I want to make sure the shoulder is centered before I work down the tube and I obfuscate that tubing with my hand so that my brain doesn't try to find the equilibrium between the two you know <laughs> wobbles right I just want to center the one wobble and focus on the one wobble and I think glass is a, a series of like you know, narrow vision and wide angle vision. And you have to sort of, you know, like painting, you got to step away and look at it from further back sometimes. Yeah. So it's truly not a prayer to the glass gods because it, it kind of looks like or like a like a like a jedi like yeah. smooth out <laughs> you want to be smooth. <laughs> um, well, yeah. There's a little bit of that, right? A little bit. Yeah, there is, there is, there is. It's, you know, you got to put the juju in it somehow. <laughs> <laughs> All right. And All right. now you're tipping this off again so that it doesn't have any of the, that optical stuff you were mentioning before. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Sometimes if I just can't get rid of that nipple by condensing and blowing, I'll, I'll re tear until I even it out that way. Yeah. And it's I almost really like slow. an optic lens, isn't it? Like a, it's yeah. almost like a small lens on the tip. Um, mm -hmm. I've used a lot of tubing that Taffy's pulled. It's the best tubing ever. <laughs> Thank no matter you. what the base color is, the, there's something about the, uh, the, you know, the, the temperature and the, um, and the way that you pull tubing that just makes it pretty workable most of the time. Thank he you. sends it with his special memory. <laughs> Yeah, it's um, I, I really enjoyed pulling tubing. It was a really fun process, and I still get a chance to do it from time to time. But um, yeah, it's it's fun trying to you know use some of those hot shop techniques like gathering an even bubble and controlling it. It just it was um, it was a great time <laughs> in my life. But I don't think my body could handle making tubing like I used to. <laughs> so while a lot of different colors move pretty different very differently and like you said with this particular sparkle based color it it works a lot like metal where it kind of holds its heat and is, stays mm -hmm. fluid for quite a while um I'm, I'm sure that pulling all these different materials gave you a, a really great like um like overall view of how how much differently each material flows yeah, yeah, it was a great way to be like, okay, this is the movement point, and this is the freezing point, and it just sort of gave me a second sense of these colors. Um, but it also is like, okay, I have 46 pounds of this color to pull, um, and, you know, 10 of those is going to be me figuring out how to pull it the right diameter mm -hmm. and the right wall weight and everything. And, and that was sometimes a nightmare. Certain colors are just very difficult to work with. Um, yeah, I don't miss that. <laughs> I think I think it, it helped me learn boro faster by pulling tubing. As you suggested, it's like sort of you know, you're not heat you're you're taking it from molten and pulling it down into cold and that process without introducing any other flame or heat into it, it's it's a really interesting way to get to know a color. And so, I mean, you know, that's one thing, whether you work solid tubing, that's one thing we learn over and over is how, how 
differently. Uh, a, you know, a cadmium based color works to some kind of stiff color. I mean, just all the different qualities are um, pretty layered and in, in, in depth with color. Yeah, and some of the, some of them like the colors uh, themselves have to be ran at different temperatures. Cadmium in particular has to be super cold, so pulling that one is a nightmare. Hmm. Um, star white is similar. Star white will outgas after twenty two fifty, I think it'll start to outgas. So you got to keep it down at twenty two hundred. And were you batching like pre pulled colors, or were you making your own, or? Yeah, I was. I strictly, I was strictly melting other people's colors, and pretty much, gotcha. you know, North Star, North Star Troutman, Glass Alchemy, and Greasy, uh, and then Bora Batch a little bit towards the end. But I never made my own both okay. colors. And I was never really good at melting color. That was always the hardest part for me was making a nice uniform, even batch from top to bottom, and mm -hmm. getting it all to be, you know, hom homogenous was a nightmare. Um, pulling it sort of where I enjoyed the process. Okay. So here I, I did blow that other side out. That'll be the top now. And now I'm going to probably blow the bottom out <laughs> uh, to match it, get it ready to go inside that outer cup. You're really diligent in capturing all the moves, aren't you? <laughs> yes yes yeah if you you know the reel is like a minute and a half the demo is like two hours and, uh, nice. you know it's like man if you're gonna show most of it you know you may as well just show it all and <clears throat> yeah yeah and that's so, what the, the magic happens in these little tiny moments right and it's it's funny it's like so much setting up for this one little you know yeah um here is a good wide view of me centering that's the first time I've seen it. So I'm finding that high point and I'm pushing down with my thumb on my right hand and pulling away to stretch out that weld. Um, so I'm, I'm kind of centering and, and stretching that weld at the same time. And then once I have that shoulder centered, then I, I worry about the rest of the piece. That looks a little off centered for me, but from here. <laughs> <laughs> it's just your angle. It looked good yeah. if you blocked you put your hand over half the screen. Well, yeah. <laughs> this is what right now I probably centered the, the top half of the piece and I realized that it was kinked somewhere in the middle. So this is me like after centering the top half, I'm gonna get that middle hot and I'm gonna recenter the bottom half and trying yeah. to straighten it out yeah. a little bit better. Okay. Yeah. yeah I, I thought you meant on the blow tube side or on like on the roller side. I was like, I don't know, man, I look pretty damn good to me, but <laughs> Yeah. There we go. That's a little bit better. This is another thing that I've spent a lot of time looking at a piece that's on a blowpipe on a bench and centering it from that level plane. Um, so it just makes sense to me. And it's, it takes a while to get used to sort of how to, how to read it and how to react to it. I probably could have skipped a couple of these tipping off moves or whatever, but <laughs> just wanted to keep you guys here longer. <laughs> well, it's been really cool doing this and being a part of this, this uh, tool making venture and seeing, you know, how it helps people, how people utilize it in their own practices and, you know, a lot of customers and, and, and co-workers who said, oh, you know, I had shoulder, shoulder surgery and I couldn't lift, I couldn't work big anymore. And this helps me kind of work bigger or I have carpal tunnel and this, you know, I mean, that's been super, super rewarding hearing these folks that are um, having an easier time making what they want to make. Yeah, that's pretty awesome. Yeah, it's been really rewarding part of this whole process. What color did you, what was the name of this color you, did you say earlier? I, I, I refer to it as Molly Sparkle. I'm not sure what <laughs> the greasy folks call it. I might have actually the label somewhere. Let's see if I can find it. 
get a whole bunch of really great scientific articles if you search for molybdenum borosilicate glass. Mm. Yeah, I mean, molybdenum is used in high temperature, uh, like quartz elements. Uh, hmm. It's an interesting heavy metal. Hmm. And, it, you know, most of the time we're using oxides in glass. I believe this is a sulfide. But I'm not really sure. I'm, I'm not much of a... <laughs> knowledgeable about chemistry of glass is why I stayed away from melting it. Well, it. actually, one of the articles is the top article is improving molybdenum and sulfur vitrification in borosilicate. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so greasy just calls this sparkle. Oh, okay. Good. It's because I made fun of him one time for that color called pumpkin spice. You didn't he make fun like, of him. You were <laughs> like again. laughing about the name and the seasonality of it. You weren't making fun of him. Yeah, yeah, no, fun, we weren't making but... fun of him at all. No, yeah. no, no. <laughs> oh, he had some, they, they had some questionable names back in the day. <laughs> they did. They, did. <laughs> <laughs> they were funny, though. <laughs> yeah, it's funny. It's literally just labeled Sparkle Rod. But it does yeah, say what yeah. you're mentioning. It's a uh, no chrome metallic flake, meaning it can be worked in yep. any setting, surface, or deep encasement. Yep. Yep. I'm I'm very fond of it. Sounds pretty cool. I might have to do like a sparkle eye cane or something if it's truly deeply encasable. Yeah. It's one of those Not things, entirely. too, where, you know, like um, with most of the sparkle colors you'll use, you say, okay, I've only so many heats and definitely so much time in the kiln before um, before the piece has to be finished. And you really do see a working range with this uh, base material. So. Yeah, yeah. I, I basically can't work with colors that are that finicky because I tend to reheat and reheat and reheat until I'm happy with the shape, <laughs> as you can see. Um, <laughs> so, so yeah, I, I'll, I'll basically find the colors that I like working with and, and stick to them. And with greasy, even though, you know, anybody's to be anybody's color, I'll generally get a bunch of stuff to try and find the ones I like, and then go get a bunch of that. Cause it's not always around. It might not come back. You know what I mean? That's generally the way I operate when finding stuff I like to work with. Yeah. <clears throat> Just a taster, a little pound here, a pound there. And then, Oh, that stuff's great. I'm going to get, you know, as much as I can swing. Yeah, and that, that shape is really coming together. I wish I knew how many cups, how many pint glasses I've made in soft glass. Right. How many years have you spent in the hot shop? Um, well, it was 10. I mean, it's going on 17 now. Um, but, but 10 basically full time before I started doing Boro. And then um, mm -hmm. over the last seven, eight years, it's been transitioning to doing boro full time and kind of doing soft glass on the side. I see. What made you want to try boro? Um, uh, I, uh, I had a friend who suggested that I pull tubing. Who was, who was, you know, we started in a hop shop together and he switched to boro cause he was into making pipes and worked at a pipe shop. And, um, he suggested I go to the DFO. Uh, I'm not sure what year this was, maybe 2011. Um, I was in grad school at the time and, uh, for soft glass and I, I went to the DFO and I was just blown away at what people were doing and the culture and, and the ingenuity. And it felt like I, like I walked into the edge of the glass world. Like I walked into a glass door, you know, it's just like dong, like, Oh, you know, here's the edge. <laughs> here's okay. all these people that are, that are doing stuff that are, you know, it's completely new and they're pushing the boundaries and. I think that's what attracted me the most is like, I want to explore and, and, and soft glass has been done for so long by so many great people. It's, it's, um, there's certainly more stuff to do, but Boro is, it just felt like this, this wild frontier and I, I wanted a piece of it. Nice. What was your uh, first torch? Um, it was one of those old Cymax screamers. <laughs> you know, those, those cavalier whatever thing yeah yeah and, yeah. Then, and then i got a bethlehem Maya. bravo i got a bethlehem bravo that i rocked for a while and then i got a delta elite that used to be uh alex uba tubas that i think uh catfish john now has okay uh, and yeah delta elite was my favorite yeah 
That was my progression, was the Bravo to the Delta Elite. I guess I had a champion mm. in between, too. But it was mm -hmm. just because like, I couldn't get that Delta Elite right away, so sold that champion yeah pretty quick. and i the the way i work is more you know it's more like a glory hole where i'm like i'm you know spot heating and then i'm overall heating so having the bigger delta elite flame is like you know i don't know i i really enjoy this i can do most of the stuff i do with the delta elite now yeah <laughs> I'm, I'm mostly marini work so it's it's a, a dream for me super condensed heat and such a tight flame it's great Um, I'd like to mention, actually, uh, I haven't announced it yet, but I'm doing a um, an in-depth roller class at at Pittsburgh Glass Center. Okay, nice. it's June June I think 12th through the 19th, I believe. Um, oh, yeah. I'll announce it. I'll announce it, you know, on my page when it's when it's more clear. But uh, it's the first. And generally, I do demo only classes and try to just give as much information as I can. This is going to be like a five day. I do a demo in the morning and then I help everybody work on the rollers um, and then I do another demo at night kind of a thing. Um, oh, so if you're interested, if you're interested in learning this approach uh, in depth and, and want to take it, you know, up a notch, um, it'd be a really good opportunity. I don't know how many times I'm going to get to teach class in this sort of structure. Awesome. Yeah, Breaking right. news. You heard it here first. Yeah, this is your chance, guys. <laughs> Reach out now. Snag those seats. Yep. Do you know how much it'll cost and that sort of thing? Uh, I don't. I think it's nine fifty for the five days. Pretty cheap. It's yeah for or, five days. That's great. Yeah, okay. yeah. I, no, I, it's I could be wrong. Though. The Pittsburgh Glass Center is a great facility. Really good place um, for you to yeah. do that, and it, it is a really comfortable space to work. So I think the students will have a um, a nice comfortable space as well. Yeah, I love it. I've taken a bunch of classes there. It's a it's a great facility and great people that run it. Um, my my buddy Brian Randa is also teaching the week before. I'm going to TA for him. Nice. And that'll be a more sculptural based class. Um, but I highly recommend if if you're into sculpture or just any type of working, uh, check out Brian Randa's work. He's uh he's one of the most um, graceful glass blowers I know. And he works both in soft glass and boro and can do just about anything sculpturally. How do you spell his name? Do you know? Um, Brian with a Y and oh. Randa, R R A N D A. Randa Glass, uh, you guys. Here we go. Randa Randa Glass, yeah. He's uh, he's a good friend of Grant Garmese's and they, they do a lot of work together as well. Nice. Man, wow. So oh, here it is. Here's the page. Garmese. Here is the page that you're all looking for. Uh, Carrie's, you're linking it in the chat. Oh, thank you. Yeah, the Pittsburgh Glass yep. Center classes. Oh, Pittsburgh Glass Center. Okay, I thought you meant this cat's Instagram. I'll link that. Yeah. I'm right here with it. Very cool. Yeah, that's an awesome opportunity, man. Whenever you announce it, dude, we'll share it in Torch Talk and pin it up to feature thank you. posts, man. Yeah, dude, of course. We do that for any class, but it's always nice when it's somebody we can really speak to as well, you know, and say, hey, man, this is a truly a awesome opportunity. Man, I also, can, you know, uh, take some time in Pittsburgh for a little bit longer. Amount of Scookies teaching them later in July or early oh, July. Oh, sweet. Yeah. yeah, that's he's he's incredible. Um, yeah, I, I this is also, you know, I think a lot of people who who have their approach figured out, they've been working for a long time. They're not they're not really interested in um, learning this this kind of approach. You know what I mean? It's it's just like, oh, it's like, why am I going to go backwards and relearn this this new thing? Um, so I get it. I, I, I definitely welcome beginners or people who are starting out and, and see this is like a, you know, a funner way to work or something when we are curious about it. I'm also really interested in teaching hotshot people how to work in Boro with mm. this approach. I feel like they'll pick it up quickly. So I welcome them as well. Nice. And I, I, I gotta, I gotta, um, you know, add to that, Nikolai, I would definitely say that even when you have an established process and say, um, you know, you follow the Italian cup making steps to a T, it, it does take a lot of wear and tear on your body. So, you know, mm -hmm. part of the idea is to be able to continue to make what you make and, and if it takes modifying your process. Um, so 
maybe, maybe it, it speaks to the old guy flame worker as well. <laughs> you know, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. The older you get, the more this, you know, this is going to affect your body. And if you can learn tricks to let you do this easier and more like intelligently. Yeah. Yeah. I actually took a class in um, Philly recently with Mike Raman and you know, that guy can do anything by hand, but uh, he was working on a really large, uh, uh, what was it? One of his bases. And uh, you know, I, I, I had my roller there and I shoved it in, in front of him and he started using it and he was like, okay, okay, I'll take one, you know, like, <laughs> I really had to twist his arm, but, um, there certainly are times, like if you want to scale it up or you want to work bigger or you, you know, you, you dislocate your shoulder playing soccer or something, you know what I mean? It's, it's, uh, it's a good tool to have around and take some, take some weight off. This is exactly what's going to happen to Carrie because she plays <laughs> soccer and... <laughs> She plays a little dirty, y'all. She plays a little dirty. No, I don't. I, I mirror. <laughs> yeah. Mirror. So, um, jumping back to this demo, the uh, making the shoulder even. You know, I, I spend a lot of time on each end, trying to get that optic nice and clean. But the side that I'm going to flare the lip on, it has to be as clean as I can possibly make it. Um, and the only way to get a lip that doesn't need to be cold worked or cleaned up as far as like flaring the traditional way is to really spend your time here trying to even out that wall and and center that hole that you're going to pop as best as you can um i've never gotten good at doing the flame tear so <laughs> i stick to this okay more soft glass style flare i also don't like using jackson boro for whatever reason, that's like this, huh. the feeling, the feeling of the metal. I, I don't know. I take, I stick to graphite. I use a lot of graphite. Yeah. I was noticing that because like for, for flaring, uh, even the blow tubes and stuff, I'm like, I bet you go through a lot of those heads. Yeah. <laughs> um, not so much, actually. I, my graphite lasts until I drop it usually. Okay. <laughs> Um, so it's a very small opening at the, oh, you're putting a handle on, you're not doing the flare right now, correct? Yeah, this, I, I'm not sure what I'm, no, this, this is, is this the, is, this is the handle that's going to get slid into the other one. So you're pot, you're capping it off and popping the hole for air access. Yep. That's correct. So that's the 12 mil handle and I'm going to recenter it. I've since uh, the hardest part about doing these double wall cups is, is finishing the bottoms. Um, and especially doing a vacuum seal. So what I, what I've been tending to do now is instead of making something that I'll open up the bottom at the end and tear away that 12 mil solid connection. Um, I now will incorporate a little, almost like a perk that goes in there on the tip of that 12 mil that stays in there. And then I can, I can tear away some material, but sink that outer wall cup into meet that 12 mil perk. And then I still have that, that little air pressure there. There's a trick to getting it. I basically seal it up completely and then pop a hole dead center and then seal up like a, a nine five handle so that I can do that final little seal with as small of a tubulation as possible. Okay. But it's, it's really tricky to get, to get that hole done and close up the bottom and, and have still air pressure to pop out. It's just, it's, it's a whole lot of scary stuff all at the end of all this work. Right. I think, uh, I don't know if, I don't know if surf rat is in the chat, but he, he knows what I'm talking about. <laughs> I saw, I saw he's been having trouble with these double wall. Cups. Are there uh, complications to sealing that off when it's been filled with a gas, for example? Yeah, especially when it's filled with a gas. When you're when you're just trying to make a vacuum, you not even a vacuum seal, just just a you know airtight seal. It you have to do it as the piece is cooling at the right. You know you can. There are ways to like heat it up with a Bunsen burner on a lathe and control the air pressure as you're doing that final seal. Um, I'm not really good at that because I don't have a lathe and I haven't been able to play with it. So 
doing that final seal is tricky enough when there isn't a vacuum. But when you do a, a plasma backfill, you're vacuuming everything down to, you know, crazy pressures, like the pressure of space, basically, the vacuum of space. And then sealing that final tubulation is really difficult without having that, that glass pull back into itself and weaken yeah. that tip off. And you're always left with this little nipple. So incorporating that nipple in such a way where it's not going to, you know, make it sit funny or it's not just sticking out. A lot of people like uh, Rose Glass Art, I think is the best I can think of, who will, you know, incorporate the tip offs into the sculpture themselves. But doing it in a cup and making it really clean. Um, I've done like one that I'm happy with. And there's a nipple because I take it you need to pull it out some to kind of counteract that it's naturally going to want to suck back in or. Yeah. Well, you basically, you set up this little tubulation as thick as possible with the narrowest little, you know, air running through it. Um, so that when you, when you do heat and, and tear that away, it, it basically, you know, it's vacuuming itself closed and you, you want to, you want to basically vacuum it closed and rip the excess material off in one move. And that's your one shot. And if you put any any more heat into there and it spreads out, it'll pucker inside um, really quickly because it's a whole lot of pressure. Okay. I got you. So really thick. Similar to doing it without the vacuum, I've seen like a really amazing Sally Prash video where she's like just sealing a pine cone into a tube or whatever. And she has that mm -hmm. like, you know, almost like the thickened point, you know, or whatever, the, the thickened shoulder. Uh, in order to be able to close that off without that immediately sucking down on itself. Yeah, yeah. It, I, I, I learned how to do this with doing like little, you know, pendants, little hands in a bottle, that kind of stuff. That's a good way to practice doing airtight seals and, and what will happen when, you know, <laughs> you do it too much. I got you. So practice on something that's not like a really nice cut first. Yeah. <laughs> right. Okay. Yeah. Gotcha. Don't start with your masterpiece. Uh, I'm not sure what I'm doing here. Oh, I'm probably gathering up to make a little solid connection somewhere, but I don't know. I don't know why. It's just a quick marble demo, man, you know? <laughs> <laughs> Another really good example of that that um, uh, termination point that you're describing that um, really thick tubulation right to its closed point would be any hollow stem uh, goblets. So like Roger Paramore is a really big proponent of these beautiful hollow stems and, uh, and Cesare is supposed to always close down in that same taper, nice. Uh, like you said, about as thick as it can be with the air lead still going through. Yeah, yeah. The tip, the, the tip off, I guess it's called in the, you know, neon world. Okay. Have you ever done any neon work or? Um, a little bit. My neighbor uh, here in my studio is um, a neon shop. They're they're great. They do they do a lot of the plasma fills. They filled this for me. Nice. Um, yeah, and I've gotten to play around with bending that stuff, and it's definitely challenging doing all the you know switchbacks, and it's a whole new way of like planning out. You know, you have nine feet of tubing, and it's got to have all the letters. <laughs> it's. Right. I have a lot of respect for for the people that do it well. It's, it's something I think I'd have to do for months before I'm happy with. <laughs> oh, okay, so it looks like you gather that up so you can grab a bunch of material out of out of the bottom, or set this on the bottom. Or... Um. Yeah, I'm probably setting it on the bottom. Um, okay. Probably for security's sake, I'm I'm putting a nice solid connection here that I'll put that 12 mil oh, okay. solid gotcha. handle onto. Okay. Yeah. So it's. Yeah. I believe that's what's going on here. Yeah. And, and this yeah. is you know I was still figuring out at this point how to do these seals in the bottom. So this is this has changed a little bit in my process. Okay. They're a fun challenge, though. I like doing these double walled cups. It's especially fun making something on the inside that's different. Like this is, you know, a pint inside of a pint, and it's it's fun and and I enjoy making them. But doing like a goblet, something that's delicate and people wouldn't want to own or necessarily use, 
and then putting it inside of something much stronger and solid like a pint glass or pilsner. Um, mm-hmm. It's this sort of fun juxtaposition and something I really want to play with more. Okay, so you're putting totally different shaped cups inside of these is what you mean? Yeah, yeah. I've done a few. I did a cool one with reed glass. Okay. Um, I was a tremendous shaper. And I, I think, you know, it's I'm sort of barely touched what you can do with it. There's so many so many fun ways to mess around with this. Uh, right now I'm working on one that's basically a totsa bowl with a little clear dome in it. Uh, and it's floating above the stem and the tip of the stem has a, a reed cab on it. So the two, you know, the cup and the stem and the foot aren't touching each other. They're just kind of floating in between the two hmm. inside of the inner wall, outer wall, sorry. Oh, that yeah. sounds really interesting. We uh, we need yeah. you to uh, update your Instagram a little more, brother. <laughs> yeah, clearly. <laughs> I'm yeah. like, where's all this I'm cool really... stuff he's yeah. talking about? <laughs> I'm really bad at that. The same, brother, same. Yeah, I'm trying to do better this year and trying to do better with these uh, reels. Seems like everybody's been digging the, uh, the, the quicker videos, so I'm going to be doing a lot more of those this year. Cool. Yeah, we only have so much attention span. Yeah, no doubt. I mean, you kind of got to feed. I mean, it's awesome. There's like 100 people here with us right now. It means the world to oh, me yeah. that, that we're all here enjoying this together. And you guys are having fun in the chat. It's like, it's the dream for me. Uh, but at the same token, like there's just so many eyes on these reels. And there are a lot of people who are not going to join us for two hours to talk glass and watch an in-depth process unless they really, really need to. And, uh, and that's okay. And we are sitting on yep. a mountain of amazing things. And I, I actually really kind of warmed up to the notion of, uh, I'm like a bit of a completionist, as you can tell, you know, especially when we do these long format things. I mean, I used to really beat myself up if for any reason, like a shot in a process was missed, even if it were something not even that consequential. And uh, yeah. and now I'm getting much more warmed up to the idea of like figuring out just what is critically needed to share this with somebody with a basic glass education, and yeah, it's, I've kind of found my zen with that, and I'm yeah. gonna put more time on it now because, you know, I mean, twenty thousand views in like twenty four hours on some of these reels is a lot different than what we're able to do here on YouTube right now, especially with like two hour long videos, you know? Yeah. So, right. Yeah. Well, it's been cool seeing, I mean, I, I don't tune in a lot um, to any sort of, um, you know, demo spaces. Uh, I feel like I'm sort of, you know, up in the cave in my own little world yeah. trying to sure. go deeper in what I, what I've come to work on. But um it's really cool seeing some of the stuff that you put out and like, you know, even the stuff that just, you just put out with map glass and hearing about like the style and the approach and doing the Encalmo the way they do and the provenance of working with Emilio Santini and all those cats out in Richmond. Like that's, that's really cool to, for the people that are, you know, out in the Midwest or just have, don't know, you know, that all these guys are related, Egon and, you know, all these cats yeah. went to VCU and, and it's just, it's, it's cool to have these pockets of, of style and approach and community that, you know, they interchange a little bit, but it's, it's, you know, it's, it's really cool that somebody is out there um, educating and sharing and, and connecting the dots for people. Well, cheers. So I really man. enjoy what you've done. <clears throat> Appreciate that a lot. It's mean, means the world to be able to kind of help make our world a little bit smaller and, you know, gives like the opportunity to share an amazing demo like this and kind of give our, give all these people out there a taste of this amazing event and it's been a real honor to, to get to share this stuff and that's a big part of that real thing it's like i, I feel a, yeah. a bit of like a, a like a weight like i've been given this tremendous opportunity how can i play it best for the events for the artists for my audience you know and for the community at large and you know, I, I do think that sharing some of this shorter stuff that a lot more people will be able to take the time to watch and just another way to, to yeah. anyways, I'm trying to play this hand as best as I can. <laughs> and I, it really is. I, I'm like, well, I think I'm like the luckiest dude in Boro sometimes. Well, it's cool seeing you out there. And I do hope you, uh, you make this into a, a short reel. <laughs> <laughs> that one. 
I want to um, see it condensed into two minutes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, on your no, demo no. here, Nikolai, um, you, you, yeah. you've been on a solid handle for a little bit now, right? Yep. And yep. the tube was completely closed before you opened it on the... Before you um, so after, yeah, after I did that bottom solid seal um, on the punty, I still had my blowpipe attached on top. And when I went to tear that blowpipe away, I had my blow hose attached to the top and I, I blew a hole as I tore the, the tube off and then nice. tore that hole as evenly as I could uh, to be open. And you can see how much this is fighting me. It doesn't want to be a flat lip. Um, and that's the memory that I put into it or where I pop that hole. So I'm, I basically try to flare it out until it's parallel. Um, then I'll work on paddling building up heat in about an inch to an inch and a half from the lip down. Um, and then I paddle the side and then I paddle the lip. And what I'm trying to do is convince the glass to go straight into itself over about an inch and a half of, of range. I don't want it to just like curl the lip in on itself. Right. Um, yeah. So there's sort of a trick to, to erasing that wobble in such a way that it doesn't really show up as much. So yes. I'm going to do that again and again, as I have it in this sort of, you know, it's like flaring open from the speed at which I'm turning the centrifugal force. I'm closing it back down and then smashing that lip and trying to even out that lip without thickening the lip. Yeah. Having that much hot kind of gives that material a place to move back to. So it doesn't all kind of just collapse yeah. into a small zone. Okay. I'm with it. Yeah, yeah, it gives it it gives it a range to to accept that change, versus just like you know all that going on one little high spot. Right. I gotta say the speed of your rotation right here, um, I can't do that by hand. It's hard to turn. It's hard to turn at that speed if you don't. Yeah. Have the, yeah. The turner support. I, I certainly can't do this by hand without a roller. Um, yeah, there's no way. I noticed a few times too when you're really saturating heat into a large portion of the tube, you really got to turn them pretty good. The mm -hmm. speed's pretty significant. So there, I'm taking a little measurement for myself just to make sure it'll. I'm not going to make the the outer cup too short. Okay. But yeah, the the speed is significant. You're right, Scott. I do. Um, I basically, my rule of thumb is I turn only as fast as I need to, to keep the thing on center and give it even heat. But there are times where like, I'm, I'm going to, um, in, instead of like heating and, and holding up, uh, the, the, the bottom, the foot, so it squishes down, I'd rather spin really fast and let that centrifugal force spin that shape out. Um, and I, there are a lot of times where I do that with like, I'm working with, um, somebody's prep that does marini stacks or chip stacks or whatever and i don't want to i don't want to smear the glass and i don't want to i don't want to um, thin out the pattern so I'll, I'll do a lot of shaping just with centrifugal force sort of keeping that wall expanding like you would on a lathe kind of turning it up turning up the juice a little bit Um, so yeah, so I get, I got this, this outer wall set up pretty close to what I needed and then did the inner cup. And now I'm going to make sure that, you know, this fits. So when you asked me about using calipers, this is sort of a slow way around it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Now I noticed you were using like an egg. Was that like a Mickelson egg or is that, is that something yeah. you had made or? No, it's an old school Mickelson egg. Nice. I, I love it. I do a lot of, you know, cup shapes where the, you know, the curved top of bell shape, uh, it makes it a lot easier, a lot more control. And yeah. you can do the same thing by using a straight reamer and, and then closing it back down with a paddle, but it's not as, it's not as easy. Yeah. I like the eggs a lot. It's just, it has like a good feel for manipulating that, that, that wall up or whatever versus a straight like the jacks or a reamer even mm -hmm. i've got like a fun little collection of them i've got like a couple from different tool makers and then like a medium mickelson one nice i really want to get a reverse one what is <laughs> that doing mean? like 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 the the wide part of the egg on the tip oh okay interesting um just for doing stuff like a tatsa or a bowl or you know digging out a sort of wider shape like that 
Yeah. Be fun. I need that paddle and then just make a shitload of bowls in a row. Yeah. You know, I mean, these days I do, I, I do a lot of hot popping, so I don't have to <laughs> do those crazy shapes by hand. What does that mean? Hot popping? Like where you make a score and then pop it or whatever? Yeah. Yeah. So if I'm going to make a tata, for instance, I'm instead of trying to flare it out and catch the lip, like the traditional way is I'll just make a sphere or a, a skittle and pop it in half. Hmm. Do you chuck There's it up a super the... cool technique to see, when I, you know, yeah. someone who's it's mastered those... the hot pop. It's a, it's a very cool thing to watch. Yeah. yeah it's, it's, it's magic, man. It's so, <laughs> I'm, I mean, I'm no Steven Pierce. Like there are, uh, there are yeah. certainly people to, to watch do that, that are, that have it down. It's, it's a, it took me a long time to any sort of sixth sense about how hot to get it and how much water to use. You know what I mean? And I what still get you, it wrong all the time. <laughs> what do you score it with? I use a single diamond point tipped uh, scoring pen. Okay. Um, they're kind of hard to find. Do you um, do it on the taffy roller? I have. I don't. I don't like to. Uh, I do intend to one day make a, an arm that allows you to sort of lower. You know, oh, it, would, yeah. it would support the, the scoring knife just like oh, a lathe yeah. system. You know, yeah. but uh, I, typically if I'm doing hot pops, I go to a friend's shop and use their lathe. Use the lathe, okay, and I, I got you. A little more, a little more control. But I've done plenty on the roller, as far as demos and stuff, on the fly. Uh, that's pretty cool. Yeah, it, it has a much lower success rate. <laughs> okay. Oh, oh no. <clears throat> All right. So now you're gonna work back the other side of the outer cup. Yeah. Will you be uh, make it to Las Vegas this year? Unfortunately, not. I, no. I uh, oh. yeah, I'm saving my pennies so I can go to uh, Vail for the drinking vessels pint mm. show. Oh, Co nice. Cup with ben show. Belgrad, yeah. He, uh, yeah. He taught me how to use a lathe, actually. Right on. Yeah, yeah, he's a good dude. I'm I'm gonna be um, going out and working with Avant Garde, I think, beforehand, a little bit. That'll be fun. Yeah, that's great. Um, yeah, so no no Las Vegas this year, but I, I plan to go out there next year. Okay. Now, when you have that paddle, are you applying pressure, or are you just, like, letting it ride on the cold part and blowing out against it? Like, what's happening there exactly? Um, A little column A, a little column B. I, I go real okay. slow. I try to – I'm trying to chill the high points and the thin points and then blow that other material out to the paddle. And then once it gets there, then I'm sort of being forceful and trying okay. to tell it where to be. I got you. But, you know, gentle persuasion is the key here. Um, one of my favorite things I've learned in glass, um, which actually I didn't learn in glass, but uh, slow is smooth, smooth is fast. I try yes. to go, yeah. you know, on the slower side of things, on the thicker side of things, and it generally it's when I'm rushing <laughs> that... I blow too much too fast and thin it out and then I'm fighting it the whole time. And you know what I mean? So just a, it's just a good yeah. adage. I, I tend to draw it up every time I teach a class on the board. It's like a mantra. Yeah, no, I've, I've <clears throat> in my own work, of course, I try to implement this. I'm not very good at it, but I've noticed it with a lot of glass workers who, you know, they seem very methodical at the time, but when you actually look at the clock and what gets accomplished, because there's no fucking around. It's like they end yeah. up getting a lot done very quickly, even though it can feel very methodical and slow at the time. So yeah, yeah. It's, uh, yeah. There's Increase like that success rate. For sure. So I mean, it, in the last own, move I no, did. Go ahead, man. Sorry. sorry. No, it's all uh, you. The buddy. last move I did before I did that paddle, I had a reamer, a straight reamer. I think you saw. So I had that saddle sinking in there, and I got the heat built in, and I put the reamer at an angle where I'm riding the cold points, the high points, um, kind of, you know, across at a 45-degree angle, that trough. And that way, I, as I blow, I can touch the whole wall in that saddle and sort of control it as it blows out because it always wants to blow out faster on one side versus the other. Huh. So I like to have – it's almost like paper in the hot shop when I'm – when I have something that 
is a ton of Marini and there's soft color on one side and hard color on the other side, and it wants to blow out funky, we tend to use jacks or use paper on the outside as we blow every time to sort of control how it blows out and what the outer wall is doing, even if the inner wall is, is giving us trouble. Do you think the reamer is pulling some of the heat out as well to help it? Yeah, or... yeah ab absolutely. And I, I try to use, utilize that a lot as I'm working. It's like, you know, especially if I'm going to do a bottle shape, for instance, and I, I have the neck nice and pulled out and I'm putting heat into that shoulder to puff it out and there's like a little bit of heat up into the neck, I'll ride it for a minute with the graphite and suck the heat out of it and then blow and do whatever shaping I'm going to do. But I, I, use, very, I use the graphite a lot yeah, in that way. With that chilling, you can always see a very definitive line where the mm -hmm. chill mark was made. Yep. So here I am supporting it and letting that hit fall. Like it's it's a little off center back there. It's a, it's a funky little move, but sometimes it'll, it can help you sort of get rid of that wobble it's similar to working on a lathe yeah now when you said paper earlier you mean like wet newspaper in the hot shop yeah okay yeah, just wanted to make sure we're on to. the yeah there's too many terms here it's like glory holes and flashing and paper uh, this all sounds very seedy <laughs> just the tip <laughs> Your paper so as i'm I, I, now I, I'm trying to get a little extra length here. I think I checked this um, to see how long it was with my tool and just realized it was going to be too short. So I'm doing this heat. I'm gradiating the heat. I want it to stretch, you know, overall, but I want it to stretch faster on the tip just because there's less weight. And you can see it kind of tapered on its own. So there's a, there's a way to do that if you – it's it's funky probably for most people doing it too too handed and pulling it out would be make more sense you know but i find that this approach lets me work thicker and lets me leaves me with more even optics than i can achieve two-handed okay i know plenty of people who can do you know very beautiful optics two-handed yeah <laughs> It's something I always suggest to folks is to like get your hands talking as quickly as possible in the glass game, you know. Um, if you're doing things to kind of avoid that in the beginning, it, I'm not saying you got to be t t you know, Cesare Tuffalo or whatever, but you should really find those opportunities to have two handles on hollow glass and manipulate it, blow it out, condense it. These are the things that will really get your hands talking, and there's there's a lot of situations where that is kind of the move you you have to do. Yeah, genius like Taffy over here with the amazing setup like this, but it's uh <laughs> yeah, it's like just don't. Uh, and I'm not saying that's you or anything. It's just don't don't find yourself deep in the game and having to like be forced to use methods because you've never got your hands talking. It's, uh, yeah, I mean, the the bigger your quiver is, the the more you know you can achieve, yeah, for, for sure. sure. So I I try when I'm in situations to do the Italian techniques and and just be able to you know work any which way is necessary for the shape. Um, but I certainly like I I'll, I'll try to um, strengthen my weaknesses and you know what I mean, like yeah. fill in the gaps in my in my own practice a little bit so that I'm not hung up when I have to do something that I don't like doing. I'm not really good at. Yeah, for sure. Um, but, uh, you know, they say hours equals powers. I think um, with glass, you know, I know a lot of people that work with glass for a long time. They don't change a lot of how they approach it. Mm -hmm. um, for me, it's like, you know, this, this is a conversation I'm having with this glass and everything that's going on is left over in the object. Um, and you know, what I want to do is, is listen, is get better at listening is like, okay, this happened because of this variable. And can I change that variable? And how do I change that variable and approaching it with this sort of like, you know, being trying to be aware of, of what you're doing and when it when it got fucked up and how you fucked it up and all that. And and learning from it, you know, it's just like never lose the lesson, I guess, is, is the important thing. It's not no just get like, you know, Oh, this fucking sucks. I can't do this. Yeah, for sure. There's almost always a traceable reason back to yourself. 
Yeah, thing. and I mean, it's like goblets. I, I've so many times over my career, like, oh, I'm going to make a goblet. I'm ready to make a goblet. And then I was like, oh, yeah, no, no, I'm not. <laughs> um, well. And it's still like I, I get humbled all the time by even like I'll make like a one I haven't made a one in a while, and I try to sit down and make a one and it's like super simple and yet very difficult to do cleanly unless you do them, you know, a couple of them. Yeah. So yeah, it's just, it's just, yeah, I don't know. It's just one of those things. I feel like it's, if you want to do something hard and make it look easy and make it feel easy, do it until you don't have to think about it. And that's, you know, that's the, that's the secret. <laughs> yeah. Muscle memory or whatever. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well that, that, you know, that frees you up. So if I'm not thinking about how to turn evenly or where the heat's going in, I'm just doing it naturally. Then I can focus on, how my centrifugal force, how fast I'm turning is affecting it. Like I'm, I can be more aware of what's going on. Yeah. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah, no, I do. It reminds me of something Kiva was talking about as well. And you know, he, he'll, when he's doing like the big globes, he'll rock the full spaceman suit and the face shield and everything. <laughs> and he was talking about how, uh, yeah, you know, of course you can kind of fight your way through it. You know, a lot of us, you know, are like be a man or whatever yeah. but at the same token like even if you're being a man about it or being tough or whatever you want to call it you some part of your brain is still having to deal with this like negative input so eliminating yep. that truly does allow you to focus on what's really important and not have any you know a clarity of purpose with the glass and not being distracted by stuff even if you can do it and you fight you know like yeah we get it you know, you're, we're all tough man we all do something pretty crazy you know, to the layman or whatever. So it's not like anybody needs to prove anything. Fucking protect yourself and allow yourself to focus and be mindful in these moments. Now here you've switched off the roller. You let yep, some gravity yep. so affect a lot, this. A lot of times, yeah, a lot of times I'll build up the initial heat on the roller and then and then do the rest by hand and then bring it back to the roller once I have the heat that I need. Let it fall on center. I move the flame away. Um, and then as it cools, then I do my final blow and straighten here. And you notice I like to put the flame underneath. I mentioned before, having the silhouette of the wall be really clearly delineated by that flame underneath it. And just, it helps you read what's going on with the glass. Okay. By having that flame underneath like that. Yeah. So, and then, and then this, now I'm just going to do little sort of touch ups, straighten it out, make sure it's all clean. Um, yeah, it's, you can see it's a little crooked there. Yeah, it is. Got, it. got a little wobble to it, so I'm not sure how I'm going to straighten it. I think again, I, I I I tend to work like for now. I'm trying to center the top to the to the center of that cup. I'm not really worried about the bottom. I'm just trying to get that top half cleanly centered, and then I'll probably flip it around and recenter the bottom. And then I get to do the foot, but the feet are my favorite part. Yeah, I think that that was where we we cut that reel from. Mm -hmm. That was a pretty contained process. Yeah, I don't know if we're condensing this bad boy down into a minute and a half, brother. <laughs> <laughs> It'll be a blur. Right. And there are certainly opportunities where you could fast forward through things and all that, but I think I just like to find these highlight moments that actually tell a bit of the story. And then if anybody's interested, you know, here we are having this amazing time together and getting to learn together. And yeah, so th there, there's more if they want it. <laughs> and yeah, like you were saying, man, if anybody's tuning in late, uh, the homie you announced here first uh, a class coming up in june in pittsburgh pittsburgh glass center is that right that's correct egc yeah. five days of learning to work like this deeply change yeah. your life yeah it'll be it'll it'll be like you know um i do a demo and i st i come around and try to help everyone as much as i can incorporate these approaches um also i got my good buddy strawberry glass is going to assist me for that class he's oh, one of my first students Oh, He's one cool. of my first students to, to get the crawl down. Oh, nice. Um, and he uses it all the time to awesome. great effects. So it'll be great. He'll be, he'll be a very good asset. Yeah, man. Soon you'll have like a whole crawl crew or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, 
Kai affectionately calls it the Taffy Two Step, but I, I didn't invent it. <laughs> the Taffy Two Step. So here I am doing that little, you know, price check. It's obviously too small, so I think I had to go several times and blow out this outer cup a little bit bigger. Um, yeah. Yep. Yeah, I wonder. I wonder if you, you know, if you did condense this down, you could probably like eliminate the three times that I heated up the tip. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, I know. <laughs> so just it makes one it time. a little more real, though, brother. It does. It does. It does. You're right. You're right. You're right. Let's say. You're right. Uh... I I don't achieve any of this shit easily and quickly. It's definitely like a slow, careful. You know, who wants to take four hours to make a cup? Kind yeah. of thing. <laughs> For sure, but I mean the results speak for themselves, man. I mean these are really simple shapes, but especially at the scale that you're doing them, like in the the shocking cleanliness, it really shows like the power of this technique. Thank you. I think we also, you know, see how the highlight on how challenging sizing this all up is, is uh, especially um, since you've been able to pretty much eyeball the diameter of the two tubes um, given that point then sizing the length and getting everything just right um, there's an incredible amount of skill and time and patience as well going on here yeah man taffy threw his calipers yes. in the river <laughs> <laughs> it looks like you thicken um, your 12-7 a little bit ahead of time before you make an attachment um some sometimes that's heavy wall um that i started with there but i i tend after i flare out I'll, I'll i'll kind of squish the the lip a little bit thicker but um sometimes i'll take the time to actually make like i'll blow out a, a long bubble on the end of a 12 7 that's thick and then flare that to a really wide collar that's something i picked up from justin carter actually he tends to like you know say the prep that he's working with is going to be a mouthpiece he starts with the clear collar on the end of his blowpipe to the diameter that he wants that prep to be. And it makes everything so much easier and cleaner. Well, if you know that, the, that your handle is going to see any amount of flame splash or, uh, or mm -hmm. uh, maybe a lot of heat while you're getting your final saturation right close to the handle, then that uh, thickened connection helps an awful lot there. Yeah, yeah. I want it to be like a, a mountain boot, you know, hiking hiking boot on the ground, not a not a high heel <laughs> you know, connection. That's the wi the wider that connection is, the easier it is. Um, hopefully this, yeah. Hopefully this is the last time I flip this around. <laughs> um, I think this is long enough now. You mean the demo or the blank on display? <laughs> <laughs> but you know, what'll happen is if I'd condense some of those parts, you know, somebody in the chat would all been like, what happened? And uh, we have to please that guy. So Yeah, well, I mean, Scott, <laughs> Scott's right. I, I would I would rather it be a very, like, you know, realist, like, this is what it takes to do what I do with this, this approach. Taffy's no, amazing. Not, no calipers. He sized it right the first time. This guy is unbelievable. <laughs> right. Yeah. It's, it's, um, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Next time you got to like slip me a 20 or something if you want that. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody in chat had a question. They noticed that there are rollers with brass wheels and some rollers with stainless steel. Is one better than the other? Ah, good question. Um, I, you know, we, we started out making these, uh, with brass wheels only. And, um, I live in Florida and the, the brass will tend to oxidize really quickly here. Um, and I travel a lot and the brass is a little softer, so it's easier to dent. So I, I made the stainless wheels as an option for people who live in salty climates or travel a lot. But in general, I think the brass is nicer, like the, the feel of it is a little softer. It's a little more grabby on the glass. Um, I would certainly, I think overall I would prefer to use it, but I'd stick to the stainless because of, you know, where I'm at and how much I travel. 
hope that clarifies it. Also, I only sell the stainless wheel ones. Um, Scott and and all the retailers sell the br the brass ones, so they they're a little more easier to find. I can't. Eat. I oof, I don't know. I I do occasionally. I'll do you know five red ones and five blue ones and kind of a things. Um, I think I've done blue, red, pink, uh, green, gold, and um, silver. Um, but we we started off with purple as the flagship color, and we had some problems with the anodizers, um, as you know, nothing gold can stay. Um, the the purple started giving us all kinds of trouble, so we switched to black. Um, it's a lot easier to get a hold of, and, and every anodizer does black. Um, so that became the flagship color. And I haven't done purples for a long time. I just did some, a small batch of them. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. A lot of these colors are so, so brilliant, you know, and they really, um, they really make the, the tool shine. Um, but it, and it, it truly is a, an added challenge as well, right? To offer uh, just the, the process itself. Can be a yeah, the, the process that, it, you know, trying to do, trying to keep them in inventory and, and, and set aside certain ones to do it. And um, it, it's certainly frustrating. It's, you know, and the, the anyone we work with, any anodizer, any finisher, is they're not going to want to do uh, you know, a couple of this color, a couple of that color. They they do it in batches and they charge a lot fee. So you have to do enough before you're even, you know, not paying through the arm, through the ass, trying to trying to get it done. Um, I like to give people the options and 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 I want people, you know, some people do want a pretty, you know, match their torch or whatever. Um, so it's it's nice to offer, but it's not something that I can do consistently. So I, I try to just keep the standard flagship uh, stocked and as best as we can. And then uh, when I have some extra ones floating around, I'll, I'll try to get some in color. Um, where, where are you at with your demo here? Are you making the foot? Yep, yep, this is the base of that cup. Um, and I used centrifugal force there to sort of spin that material out. Uh, and then as I started to flatten it, I'm tapping with that paddle and I'm pushing down as I'm, you know, I'm turning it and I'm tapping it and I'm sort of centering that material and, and also testing how, how hot it still is by how much it reacts to my paddle touching it. So I kind of wait till it's sort of sticky and I, I like to really wrench and push on it and blow hard as it's setting up. And I think of it like, like it's a whoopee cushion that I'm changing the shape of, but I'm not squeezing the air out of. You know what I mean? Like it's, I'm I'm trying to to maneuver the glass without thickening it or thinning it, and I definitely don't don't want to push so hard that fart tech. I don't want to push so hard that I'm creasing and kinking that that corner. Um, you know that's really dangerous. Is a place to add a lot of stress and end up with a broken piece at the end, whether it be a can for a, a pipe or whatever. It's, I, I you know as I work out to this edge, I take so many heats here so that I'm not going to overdo it and, and really put stress into that corner. Um, and I'm, I'm sort of wrapping that flame over the edge there, up into the, the, show, the, the hip, I guess you'd call it, so that when I push, it's, it's kind of squeezing the top half of that curve back out too, um, if that makes any sense. <laughs> Yeah, it's it's both creating the shape of like a hard edge corner inside of there is is making the glass angry and also thickening it in any way in relation to the glass around it. If it's thick and thin and thick, it's much more likely to crack when I'm, you know, working somewhere else and it's kind of cool and I strife it with my flame. You know, it's it's going to pop and crack 
much faster if if it's not uniform there. So I'm trying to I'm trying to create that shape and kink that corner out and make it as tight as possible without making it like a, a, a sharp point in there. I want it to keep it this sort of rounded rounded edge. And that just takes like, you know, moving further and further away with the heat and heating less and less. So there I I, I heated the center and I used my paddle to blow that center mass out and and center it at the same time with my paddle. I think we just missed it. You know, yeah. Not at all. Um, I generally am blowing the whole time I'm pushing. Um, at least at least a little bit. Usually it's it's just enough to keep it from collapsing. But as it sets up and the more pressure I put with the paddle, the harder I blow. It's sort of like as it sets up, I'm wrenching with the paddle and I'm blowing really hard. Ah, oh, fuck. I'm not sure, Scott. What do you think? Um. Well, I'll, uh, I'm I'm strictly going to socialize. Uh, I won't have a booth there this year. They are they're on everyone's websites, right? On yours, Nikolai. Yep. Yeah, yep. Up on mine as well. Um, Don't want to take one as your carry or your your carry on. <laughs> <laughs> it might be considered a weapon. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Spirit's gonna really charge me for that one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. No. <laughs> yep. So this, um, when I center the bottom, I center the the edge of the foot. And I generally am not centered with the rest of the cup. So I center the edge of the foot and then I work just above that into that hip right there and center it from there afterwards. Does that make sense? Generally, yeah, gen generally I'm pushing that foot off center. I'm pushing that foot a little bit off center. So when I, when I set up that blowpipe on the bottom, I center the foot itself. Uh, and then I work that, that, you know, that hip there and try and center the rest of it to it. And I'm doing the same thing that I do when I center a blowpipe here. I set it down on the roller, I turn it, I find the high side, I let it fall and I support. Usually I'm pulling out, but in this case, I don't wanna ruin my nice curve there. If I pull, it'll straighten out that wall. What I wanna do is, is let it fall and almost push back in. And sometimes I'm even sucking with my blow hose there to try to accentuate that, that curve of that hip. Oh yeah, sorry guys. I might have been muted there. I was right shouting out everybody the shout in chat. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> they missed all that. Sorry, I had my thing muted in this in the broadcast software. The homies in in the meet could hear me, but not you guys. But yeah, man. Uh -huh. Shout outs to everybody in the chat. I really appreciate y'all being here. And uh, yeah, I was passing along your questions and such as well. But yeah, Josh, Ryan, good to see you guys, man. Glassman's World, thanks for joining us, brother. David, thanks for letting me know that y'all couldn't hear me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Any other questions? Yeah, guys, now's your chance uh, to to ask these these questions and extract maximum information from our guests. <laughs> <laughs> now you mentioned that you got a graduate degree in glass. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. I went to uh, Cal State Fullerton. For glass, I studied with Joe Cariotti, um, okay. on to Soderberg, a few other guys there, and um, yeah, it was a it was a master's in in soft glass art, um, and I did a lot of uh, sculptural stuff. That's where I started inside sculpting, um, and I went I went took classes outside of school with like you know Raven Sky River and Martin Inechki, um and and. Uh, really had a fun time sort of failing at a fast rate. I mean, I was working production <laughs> jobs, you know, doing, you know, Christmas ornaments to really large scale installation stuff for other artists. Um, but in school itself, I, I had the chance to 
do things that I just was no way I would have been able to afford to do outside of school. And I'm certainly, I'm still dealing with that debt, but it was a great time for me to like, you know, try and fail at things that, that, um, I don't know. It's just, especially the hot shop is so cost prohibitive. That's another reason that I love Boro is okay. I can do this by myself in my garage. Um, but hot shop, you know, it's, it caught now it costs me about $500 a day to rent shops locally and hire a good, assistant wow um so yeah, i just can't afford to do that school. yeah and, and, and the grad school and undergrad allowed me to um do stuff that i just couldn't afford to do otherwise do you feel like had, the uh, school really pushed you conceptually as well it did yeah we did a lot of um you know it was a lot of intermingling with 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 sculptural students and 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 painters and um doing a lot of um critique um and really getting into like why we're doing what we're doing, what the choices are that we're making. Um, and to an extent, I think it was really helpful for me in my approach. Like my sense of design was improved through that education. But uh, there's something that I rejected sort of in while I was there was this, you know, this sort of sense of like, OK, the why is all important. Like if, if you're not, if you're not clearly utilizing glass because it's saying something specific, the transparency or, you know what I mean? It's just, you have to justify every choice you make and be really clear if you're going to say something important and glass itself is such a pretty and seductive material. A lot of critics say you can't make art with it unless you take away that seductive spectacle of it. But for me, I think like art in general in glass, the spectacle is part of it. You want to, you know, I want to, I don't, not making art for the art critic. I'm making art for like the nine year old that's running through the museum that skids to a stop. Like, Whoa, you know, what's that? <laughs> you know what I mean? And, and, and I think Boro and pipe in the pipe culture, it, it's much more like this has never been done, or this is really cool to look at, or this is just something that's satisfying to have around. Like there's so many reasons that are justifiable to make something and, and value something within our industry and our, our culture. And I really appreciate that. Whereas, you know, in LA and New York, you really got to be like, well, I chose this because of this. And, you know, it's, I don't know. It's I feel like push, pushing boundaries is absolutely a justifiable reason to make the work that's, that's in you. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. But I think what I, what I faced in school from my teachers and the, you know, the head professor was this like, what you're doing is sort of glasturbating. You know what I mean? And like you're you're pushing to make something as clean as you possibly can when what you should be doing is exploring what the material is going to do, you know, in ways that you don't understand. Which you know, there's there's a point to that too. Um, but yeah, I, I don't know. I think the Boro is like, like what can we get away with? What can we do? What you know? It's yeah. it's it's a much more like kind of wild west like. You know, and it's also a lot more collaborative, like, you know, the hot shop, we come together, we can't do this. There are certainly people that do it well by themselves, um, you know, Gooden Rath and um, uh, is that gentleman in North, North Carolina that does all the work solo. Anyway, we, we work in the hot shop as teams, and I certainly can't do the work that I want to do without two very skilled assistants with me. And yet when I'm doing that work, it's like my vision and I'm the gaffer and they're the assisting me in that vision. But in Boro, it's like, hey, I'm really good at this and you're really good at that. How do we put this together? How do we merge the two? How do we make this collaborative effort? That doesn't really happen in the hot shop. So it's, you know, it doesn't happen anywhere else. It truly like it lends itself to collaboration as a material and as a process more, like yeah. you said, more than many art forms that we could pinpoint now. Yeah, yeah, and I'm just in love with it. Yeah, yeah. I'm so thankful for Boro. Just imagining that professor, you know, like 30 years or 20 years later or whatever, and he's like sleeping in his car or whatever. <laughs> <Just playing. laughs> his high-minded ideas didn't work out or whatever. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, I don't know. I think, you know, when I, when I started making Boro and started making pipes, my first glass teacher was like, I wouldn't do that if I were you, you know what I mean? You don't want to be, you don't want to be known as that is doing that. It's going to ruin your, you know, your reputation, whatever. And, you know, I mean, we saw this with, with Robert Mickelson, you know, and being like, well, they have to pull, push a bowl into it. Um, 
and then realizing that it's 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 the freedom that he's always wanted to make what he wants and be supported in it you know it just took a long time for him to get there but that's also because the culture was so different back then and it was so counterculture to be a pipe maker and to be into weed and all that right i think this is we've come so far and i mean i've noticed even since i started in boro and started exploring the gap and going to gas conferences and going to dfos and those kinds of things like i watched the two worlds merge and it was this sort of like who are these stoner kids that are coming to the gas conference to hey these people are the headliners of the gas conference you know what i mean so it's it's been cool to see the the acceptance and and sort of collision of the two worlds and the yeah, cool man. things that have come from it i mean yeah. you mentioned like the, the richmond cats all those guys started off in the soft glass and it shows you know they 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 got both ends of the spectrum and and it really helped them work glass hot yeah yeah, it really shows up in all their work watch an egon whip out boro tumblers just like he does in the hot shop you know for example (laughs) so many of the movements are identical and he's just so comfortable Mm -hmm. lifting that glass out you know like it it, yeah Yeah. those guys are great and i i I I love egon if you (laughs) what's that if you don't know Egon, uh, yeah. folks in the chat, check out Egon Glass. He's he's one of the um, the best glass brewers you don't know about. If you don't know about him, he's yeah, he's, he's awesome. Lucky. Yeah, yeah. He he doesn't like the he doesn't like the spotlight, but he's so good. Yeah, for <laughs> he's sure. He's also man. he's also Grant Garmezzi's uh, main assistant and has been for a long time in the yeah. hot shop. Cool cat. We have a great yeah. demo with him, actually, you guys. Believe it or not, as low-key as he is, there's a demo that yeah. I filmed with him and Matt Murtha uh, out in Charlottesville many years ago now, but a great demo. Oh, man. A really cool demo. I made a piece with Matt back in the day. I remember him. Nice. Cool. Yeah, cool guy. Yeah. There's a lot of nice guys out there. I'm not, I'm not in Colorado now, but I have very fond memories of these East Coast cats, and it's always nice to reconnect <laughs> and... Yeah, there really yeah. is. There's a real story to be told there about all these guys who came up with Emilio, and yeah, it's it's a story I'd like to tell one day if I can ever, you know. But right now I'm focused on yeah. reels, so. <laughs> <laughs> so, another um, thing I'll mention about the demo here, I I often will get this shape, um, you know, get the foot done and flip it around, and then I'll react to the length and the skinniness of that, you know, that narrow part there um, at this point. So like, yeah, okay, you know, it's a double walled cup and I'm going to have to stretch it to make room for that inner cup. But if this was just going to be a Pilsner glass, I would take the time here to heat up that, that material and pull it out to make sure that the walls even and the shape is, is more pleasing. And sometimes that's, that's a lot of change right here where I'm stretching that out to be more narrow. And accentuating that curve in the foot, sort of like continuing the curve up a little higher. And it's right. it's those little things, I think, that make a difference in the overall shape, you know. Yeah. yeah it's really starting to sexify now. <laughs> and it's funny how it kind of solidifies, like it's it's kind of lumpy and thing, this, you know, and all of a sudden it's like, oh, there it is. Yeah. So this is, well, I don't know, sure what I, I think I still have to put it on a 16 mil handle. I'm not sure what I'm doing. I might be recentering it again. This yeah, is that, this is definitely an important part, like of doing a double walled cup, is they have to be pretty dead nuts. Yeah, yeah, this is just me truing it up, I think. And I got to switch it around. And it's it's tricky for me, at least, because I'm doing this on the roller, not on a lathe. But um, putting a 16 mil handle and then flaring that lip is in soft glass. We tend to work with bigger blowpipes when we have more mass because it's easier to turn in our hands. It doesn't hurt so bad. Um, we refer to it as driving the bus. It's like driving a steering wheel in a bus where, you know, you really got to crank that wheel to turn. The turning radius isn't that good. That's what it feels like to work on a bigger blow blow tube. Um, But you have more torque. You have more control over powering through something that's going to take a lot of pressure. So, um, like, I prefer to work with 12.7 
because I have a little bit more torque. It takes a little bit more to get a full rotation, but I can power through when I'm pushing versus like trying to turn a 10, you know, a nine, five or a 12 mil is, is harder for me. So like you can get this, you can get a fast spin, but you can't really power through if it's heavy or you really got to put pressure with a paddle or something. Yeah. It's, so really, you know, that comes into play in the most dramatic way with, you know, points versus blow tubes as well, because points are typically this really thin diameter and you get this hyper speed rotation as a result. And it's, yep. a, you know, kind of a difference in style that I think is somewhat important to, to think about and, and understanding the difference. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's it kind of forces you to slow down your rotation a little bit. But I, I, it brings up another point. It took me a really long time working with Boro before I realized that when I'm heating the outside of a vessel and I'm waiting for the movement that I'm that I want to work with, um, by the time I feel that movement in the flame, I'm overheated. And it's just like you know, I learned now to heat, get close to what I need, move it out of the flame, and let that heat that I just punched into the out, outer edge soak into that inner core and that movement still comes the movement i want it, it will get there if i wait a few seconds and i don't overheat it but i tend to like pull the heat if i try to like work until i feel that wiggly ah that's what i'm going for so i kind of i kind of backed <clears throat> off recent more recently and and sort of get close to the heat and then see if it soaks in and certain colors obviously are stiffer than others and require a little more juice but it's it I feel like it's one of those slow, smooth, smooth is fast situations where if I don't overdo it, I'm not fixing a problem. You know, I'm not creating the problem in the first place. Yep. We have a saying around here and it's pretty much a bastardization of a concept that Mattis Skooky uh kind of preaches a, a lot and that he himself stole from uh, Boyd Sugooki. And it's this mm. concept that Boyd calls buh build up heat mm. if you're familiar build with up his heat. teachings. And yes, yeah, it's this, this notion of these slower sessions and letting that heat soak in and reintroducing it and building a heat up that way instead of trying to force it. And you end up with this much more even heat, which I call dank heat. <laughs> but, dank heat. Yeah, it's, yeah man. It's, and somebody oh, one man. day will steal that from me too. It's okay. It's just the cycle of <laughs> yeah. dank. Whatever. It is. <laughs> I love, I love Boyd Sugiki. His approach is just beautiful. He makes so much sense when he's ex like describing how to approach specific shapes, like a bowl, a hemisphere bowl, for yeah. instance. Um, he's a really good teacher. If you're in Hot Shop and you want to take it up a notch, it's one of the best classes you can take with Boyd and Lisa. Yeah. They've been recognized as such many times over. It's just a great teaching combo. <clears throat> Yeah, I, uh, I'm i not even sure if I've shared it or not yet, but I actually have a lecture boy did where they were, uh, him and another gentleman were explaining this research project. Like they got a grant and they basically made all of these like 3D models of glass expanding and all these concepts of shaping. It's all modeled out in 3D and really easy to see. Um, I feel like I popped it up. I told him I was going to. <laughs> if not, I'm going to drop that really soon. Uh, it's from a gas conference. And then, nice. guys, if you uh, if you go to Corning's channel and look him up, let, let me like just find one. His name is probably like, not the easiest one. Um, S-U-G-I-K-I? Yes. S-U-G-I-K-I, yes, yes. So, yeah, if, yep. let, me, let me just he, find if you guys. You there's a video you've probably seen of him working under a thermal camera going in and yeah. out of the glory hole and blowing glass. It's a great video. And, um, you might have seen it before, but that's that's Boyd. Yeah, he shared that in this lecture, actually, like or the, in their nice. talk. Like, just at the end yeah. is almost a bonus. Um, yep. Man. There it is. Uh, it's a you. draft. Okay. This is so strange. It's like I uploaded it and got it all ready to go. Mm. I'm going to kick that Maybe live next right week's now. Maybe next week's premiere. No? You know, man, no, I'm just going to kick it live for you guys right now. Ooh. Why not? How about that? Oh, it's very cool. They, they came and did a demo at my school when I was in grad school there. 
And um, instead of doing like, you know, they did the talk of their work. And then instead of just going and showing us a demo, they had every student go through and make a shape that they were struggling with. And they worked with them to try to overcome that shape. And it was nice. so cool. It was like, you know, it was like learning in the matrix or something. It was like, I couldn't make a bowl, a low Tatsa shape. And then I could, <laughs> you know what I mean? It was like, oh, you're doing this and then do that. Move your hand this way. And it was like, do, 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 do. I was like, oh, that's how you do it. You know, it just, you know, felt like months of, of practice just sort of trickled through his way of explaining things. That's great. All right, you guys, I am going to actually schedule this to premiere. Let's see, we have about 10 minutes left in this demo. So we're probably gonna be live for another 15. I'm gonna set this for 10.30 my time. So basically just shortly after the show ends, uh, this gas thing will premiere and we can watch it together if y'all are interested. It includes that FLIR 3D footage. It's sort of just an interesting talk. Um, and we'll just keep the party going. Um, all right, what time is it now? That'll be 10.30 p.m. today, the 10th. All right. So here I am trying to flare this lip open on the 16 mil handle and I'm, you can't really tell, but I'm, my hand's really getting a workout. Oh yeah, you can see that. Um, I, I, you know, people ask me sometimes if, if I get sore, my wrist gets sore, if I have any problems with my hands or anything. And typically, no, my, my turning hand on my roller, I never have any issues with, um, but if I do a lot of freehand stuff, uh, I will get, you know, problems. Um, and it does take some getting used to, you know, I've spent years building up the meat in my hand and the calluses and everything, pulling, pushing giant blow pipes on the, on the bench. So working this stuff doesn't feel like hard or heavy or painful compared to that stuff that I'm used to. But it, you know, I could, I could see like trying to learn this at, at first and trying to figure out how to put pressure that downward pressure to keep it on the roller as you're doing this crawl in such a way that you're not putting too much pressure and bruising your bones. So there, there's definitely going to be some, you know, trying to find that edge of how, how little effort you can do to, to make this work for you is, um, you know, it took me a long time to, to tune that down. Looks like we're close to being a double walled cup. Oh yeah. Here I am probably going to price check it. Yeah. So I checked the lips to make sure that they're close enough. And I think I checked it and the lip was too big on the outer wall. Like I, I overcorrected. So I'm probably going to heat up the whole thing and then close it back down with that paddle. Shout out to Hetty Diddies. <laughs> yeah, I was gonna ask, how do you like Dragons. that red mirror? I like it a lot. I it, they're, you know, I I definitely have darker, better for my eyes glasses, but uh, I tend to look over them a lot if I have them on. And with these, they're light and they're comfortable and they they protect me enough, so I don't I don't look over them. I don't pull them down my nose. Um, yeah, I love them. Very cool. Yeah, you know, um, this glasses thing, uh, I really, I've got the face shield with the gold on it. There's the homie from Boston Distillery right there, you guys, yeah. man. This dude is There's such Jared. a boss. Jared is the fucking man. Even though I totally fucking spaced on his name earlier. I was like, oh my God, that's my boy with a J. But uh... <laughs> <laughs> he really is a cool cat. We used to talk every now and then, and it was always such a pleasure. And it's so great to see all the stuff he posts now. All right, so here's the handle trick you were talking about. Look at that. Yep. yep. That is very slick. And homies, I did just schedule that gas lecture to premiere. For some reason, it's like it was just sitting on the channel private. I don't know why I never bothered to uh, kick it live. I must maybe like I did it right before a trip or something. And but we're gonna watch it together after this if y'all want to keep the party going. Right on. So I fucked up and I made that outer handle too long. So I just ripped out that inner cup and shortened that outer handle. So I had enough of the inner handle sticking out that I could tape it them up, tape them together. And that's what I'm sure. doing here. 
I'm wrapping. I usually use electrical tape, but um, I've used other kinds. But yeah, I tape right. it together and I try to. There you go. Yeah. Put on you for capturing that. Yeah. <laughs> um, and that gives me air pressure to the little hole I popped uh, just below my solid connection on the inner cup. And now, now when I do this seal, the the cups aren't going to be you know moving, sliding in and out of each other, which would make it impossible to do this seal properly. How close are the are the two lips? They're pretty close um, as far as the depth goes. I think the inner wall is a little bit further out than the outer wall, but not by much. I want to basically flare that out close to the outer wall. Um, so that way I can keep the color all the way to that edge. You know what I mean? As I do that seal and I blow it out and I sink it in and I blow it out, I don't want to be left with a sort of r rim of clear. I want that, that color to come right up and meet that, that edge. And by having that the, inner a little wider is better. Sorry. What about the gap in mid, the space in between the two, two or three millimeters well, or less? Yeah, I mean, as little as I can get away with is what I shoot for. But if they're really tight and you spend a lot of time trying to do the seal and that heat travels down inside of there, I've had the two walls stick together and then it just, there's no way to make it happy after that. So a lot of times I'll do this, this heat and I'll come off and I'll do the heat and I'll come off. So I'm not letting that heat run down far and get away from me. I also will often use a secondary flame to really soak in heat on that edge and get rid of the little optic shit that happens when these two lips come together. And what are the handle sizes sure. here? One of them's like the 16 and the other's what? Yeah, it's 16 and 12, I believe. But if anything that nestles inside of one another really clean, and, and, okay. you know, you just don't want it to wiggle. You want You want these to be really supported. You don't want that wall, the inner wall, to like be flopping around and stick to the, the side of the outer wall. So it's like sixteen by two or something, or something. I, you know, I honestly don't know. I, okay. I basically get a bunch of different sizes and find some that fit. All right, all right. So yeah, make them fit, guys. <laughs> You're right. If there's movement whatsoever, you'll you'll see little bits of oh. haze and wrinkling. And like, what in the world? I thought I was all sealed up here. It's just yeah. that small movement that, um, that maybe you can't. Yeah. See. Yeah, that stress as it's moving and cooling is it's hard to get rid of. And you're just finishing the seal now, or? Yeah, here here I am using that secondary torch. It's really hard to get enough heat spotted into that that lip. So okay. I tend to, you know, and I, what I'm doing now, so I get the heat built up and then I run in there and I freeze it with the, on the inside with the reamer. And then I freeze it on the outside with the paddle and then I blow, you know, and I'm basically trying to keep the heat just on that lip and have the movement be just on that lip. Let it sink in and puff out a few times. It It's really hard to get rid of the optic sort of wiggle that happens in there. And the less that is left over, the less stress is left in it. Okay. And sometimes it just takes a lot of time, a lot of, you know, reheats. And that just increases the risk of <laughs> overheating, fucking it up. Yeah. It'd be a tough decision when to stay in the paint and when to get the fuck out. Yeah, yeah. That's just that sixth sense thing. Right. I yeah, can tell you, sure. I've, I've I've ruined a couple of these seals enough where I'm I'm a little more comfortable with like what I can get away with. Okay. Sometimes that's what it takes. All right, and there nice. she is after the demo, and it got, and we are gonna see it in just a second, guys. This thing is, like I said, literally the coolest piece of drinkware on the fucking planet. There it is, <laughs> filled with xenon gas. Is that right? That's right. Xenon gas. That's I'm not incredible. sure. I think it's 15. No, it's more like 30 tor, 40 tor of xenon. What's crazy is that we filled this. It. Yeah, it's it's on. So so it's filled with with uh, xenon gas, a noble gas, under a vacuum, and it's put onto a wireless. It's basically, it's a coaster, but it's it's basically a, a Tesla coil, and it's it's taking 
um, alternating current out of the wall and speeding it up to a very high frequency. And when you introduce that high frequency to a, a noble gas under vacuum, it will phase change from gas to plasma and give the electricity somewhere to go. And it tries to give it out to the atmosphere. So when you get close to it or touch it, you're grounding it through your body. That's why it's reacting to you. Um, what's cool is I filled that with my neighbors before, you know, before this year, <laughs> the last year. Um, and with all the wars going on, and the, basically the main places to get xenon in the world are Russia and Ukraine. Oh, wow. So now that was, you know, I don't know, 30, 40, 50 bucks maybe of xenon when I filled it. It's probably like 500 worth of xenon now. Damn, great investment. Yeah, shit. Yeah, wow. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's not much reclaiming that, but it was really cool. I'm I'm really glad I got to, to make that with them, and it's been great working with this plasma. So is that yeah. in your personal collection? Uh, that's in their collection for now, actually. Okay. I just haven't sold it. I left a really obvious big tip-off very close to the lip, so it's not as functional or as sort of contained as my previous plasma cups. Um, so it's more for, like, display and, and just showing off the plasma. Um, Very cool. But uh, I think it is available if anybody wants it. I'll, I'll give you a deal. <laughs> yeah, you don't want to pay for that xenon though. Speaking of availability, yeah. somebody I'm, was asking about the uh, the multi paddle too. Um, I don't have any on hand, but I'm I'm trying to get some more made. Um, I hope to have some within the next couple months. Um, okay. If you if you are interested, just DM me and we can talk about it. I'll keep you in the loop as I produce. Right on. Yeah, I love it, dude. Thank you again for joining us and for sharing this incredible demo and telling us so much about this unique way that that you have, you know, come to work. This is truly. I mean, when I was editing this demo, I was, uh, editing is kind of a frustrating process. It's just not fun. Nothing really fun about it. But I was truly enjoying yeah. this one because it's just so interesting the way that you're manipulating the glass and the self-contained kind of, you know, system that you've come up with to, to really achieve tremendous cleanliness in the forms and really amazing. Thank you, brother. Thank you. And Scott, thank, thank you for you, joining us, man, dude. It was great to have you. And yeah, man, yeah, yeah I look forward to crossing paths out in uh, Vegas, catching you social mode. Yeah. yeah. Totally. I wish I was joining you guys. <laughs> yeah, dude, me too, brother. Me too. But it's okay. There'll be another, there'll be more, there'll be more of those. There will be will be yeah yeah right. i appreciate well, you guys having me thank yeah, you so much pleasure. for joining Absolutely. us yeah thanks for being here you guys it's always it's always fun when we've got guests i mean we have a good time but it's always fun when we have guests to participate yeah. as well awesome well yeah. great demo nico and yeah fun lives you. enjoy it Heck yeah, yeah. Yeah. Thanks, brother. All right. Well, Great I'm going to go ahead and uh, bid you guys farewell. Uh, don't forget, dogs, uh, where we have a premiere coming up in like five minutes of that gas lecture because it came up in the in uh, the discussion. And Boyd Saguki is a fascinating uh, person to listen to talk about glass. Really amazing. Um, but again, you know, thanks to everybody who tuned in and joined us. You know, uh, th this was spectacular. Yeah. Thanks so much to the Glass Vegas homies. Check out, I got like a trade show floor on my hat. It's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> but seriously, oh, yeah. I, uh, I, Amy and Leanne and Jennifer and everybody else out there uh, that worked so hard to make that event special, I really appreciate them and for making this possible for us to have this time. Fuck yeah. Hope you all are off to an amazing yeah. new year. Uh, we'll probably be back live with you guys after Glass Vegas. So next week will probably be, you know, none. And then we'll be back with some freshness. And I'll be trying to post some some reels. And and then let me also say, uh, I've got my dog, my shop mate, Avalanche Glass. He's coming out to do a live streaming for you guys. So here in the next day or so, I'm going to be posting a bunch of streams. Um, I can actually kind of tell you what will be live right now if you guys are interested in hearing about it give me just two seconds and i will show you that's going to be here on the channel right uh yes absolutely all right where is my man's schedule hold on i'm gonna get it i'm gonna get it <laughs> this is good shit actually <laughs> yeah um yeah i made my man a schedule it's like a version of the the, the official one which I can show you guys as well, if I could ever find it. Whatever. All right. Hold on. Hold on. It's coming. I swear. I swear. 
All right, where's my man's message here? All right, here it comes. It's coming. It's coming right now. Any second. All right. In the meantime, yeah. <laughs> if you guys are looking for any fancy calipers, uh, Kit Paulson has an Etsy store uh, with some really awesome. Oh, calipers. they are great. For she, anybody she's that, actually you know. convincing me to use them. <laughs> nice, nice. All right. So this is my man's schedule, and he is going to be doing the live streaming for you guys. So 7 p.m. Pacific time, Friday, January 13th, shore flow, show floor opens, derby racing, all kinds of stuff. We're going to be catching up with homies at the booths. 9 o'clock at the GTT stage, Jacob Noel. Bradley Knowles' son playing Sublime to benefit the Knoll Family Foundation. This is going to be amazing. I'm going to be filming in really high quality, but why it's also going to be live for you guys. So you can enjoy this music together. Um, Gus Glass the next day, 11 a.m. Pacific time. So like, what is that? 2 o'clock East Coast time? Uh, and then at 2... 2.30 PST, Sir Pyro and Dan Hoffman. And then in the evening, we'll be live for the World Series of Glass Awards. The fuck does SSOTY stand for? <laughs> Smoke <laughs> Shop of the Year Awards. Fuck yeah. Okay. And then we'll not be going live at the Millie Meetup party, but we're going to be... Actually, me and Carrie, we're going to see George Clinton that night. So if anybody's <laughs> coming out for Glass nice. Vegas, yo, yeah, yeah, George Clinton is at the Westgate. It's like 70 bucks after fees, which is pretty cheap for Vegas. So come join us out there at the Westgate. Two tickets, right? Yeah. What's right that? On. No, it was, and, okay. it was 130 for two tickets. So. Oh, uh, okay. Yeah, yeah, Thank yeah. you. All right. Of course. I got you, love. No worries. Um, right. And then Jimmy C. A... What's up? I got a dog that's begging to go out. So I got to right, roll. Brother. I'm going to bow out. But thanks for having yeah. me. Take care, thanks, guys. Taffy. Much love, dude. Thanks for being yeah. here with us. Yep, yep. All right. Much I pleasure. think you guys get the idea. Peace. Bye, Scott. See you, brother. Yep, yep. All right, Scott. Thank you for joining us. Carrie, thank mm -hmm. you so much for being my uh, lovely co-host. And yeah, for I'll sure. catch you guys in the chat. Much love. But we're gonna about to do a premiere. So join us over there if you want to watch a cool lecture with that cool IR uh, footage at the end it's gonna be great so hell yeah all right everybody much love Nerd. peace Class community peace <laughs>